Today we're going to talk about author Nancy Brophy. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, these videos are from a one-hour clip of her testimony in her murder trial. She murdered her husband and was found guilty and is had was given a life sentence with possibility of parole in 25 years. Why didn't you make an attempt to locate it and mark it for the police like you did the ghost gun? I stumbled across the ghost gun when I was packing. That's why I marked the box. In my mind, I had a list of things I thought the police might come back and ask me for, and I thought the ghost gun would be among them. Do you see the irony in not being able to locate that and that being the allegation that that was the murder weapon? You know, I see nothing ironic about this case at all. I see nothing happy about this case at all. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really, really good example of something that we talk about occasionally, Scott, where we talk about liar's loop. And the reason I say that is because when you have a trigger moment where you have to prepare something on the fly, you get in a bind and you have to quickly respond. She didn't have to do that. First of all, she's an author. Secondly, she's had a lot of time to deconflict. She's been in prison for a few months waiting for this trial. And that overly helpful nature is her spewing out information that she's prepared to give up. We'll see her change a few times in here. She chaff and redirects, but it's not just chaff and redirect. When a person chaffs and redirects, they're doing a dance. She's not dancing. She's prepared. That overly helpful is a clear red flag. And then when she starts, what's funny is she starts to add another detail at the very end there and does an inhale prep. And then she halts and shakes her head. I wonder what she was wanting to say there. When she says there's nothing happy, you see condemning as a sides of her mouth pulled back. And she's got riveted eye contact. She is a storyteller by trade, and she's going to show us that storytelling strength through here as she takes all of those deconflicts she's been working on in that liar's loop. When we say that, I attack your story, you have to deconflict it. Most of the time, we'll deconflict before we get face to face. And that's what she's doing. One other thing I'd say, she's got resting Hartley face. I actually like that. Mark, what do you got? <laughs> yeah. So uh, though she may have organized, you know, have, have in her mind what she wants to say and be, be prepared for this, still not super comfortable. We see six moments that I counted of, of bitterness or sourness in the mouth. That's when the sides kind of come back a little bit like that. I'm overemphasizing in her. It's a little more subtle than that. Now, is that the moment for her or is this a baseline character? Is there just a, a, a general malaise of, of bitterness and, and sourness or is it actually the moment is some stress and pressure for her? Uh, I'll let you decide on that. But six moments, it's quite a lot. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, when she's saying I stumbled across the the ghost gun and this other thing about uh, in my mind, I had a list of the things the police would ask for as a murder novel writer. The gun that's actually in question was apparently none of those things that she thought the police would be interested in. I think uh, an eight year old would be able to know that the police might be interested in that gun if they were innocent. But throughout the, she said she thought the ghost gun would be among those things. There's a pause here where there's a sharp inhale occurs. You see a sharp inhale right there. She's getting ready to say something here, but something in her mind is holding her back. And at the, do you see the irony part? She deflects with a non-answer statement. There's word repetition and also phrase repetition. And I think it's strange she would think that there's a need to clarify that she's not seeing things that are happy. Uh, why would that need to be clarified by any human being when it comes to a murder? So what is the psychology of a person who thinks that they need to tell you they aren't happy about it? What is being covered up there? So there may be an unconscious desire to conceal that feeling. And that came out unconsciously thinking that that was the right thing to say, because that feeling might be there. Scott. All right. I think this is a great comparative example. As we go along, we'll see her uh, go from not being really stressed to being stressed. And this is sort of a pre-stress uh, area for her right here, because as when what happens is this, she's created this story, like Greg said, she's deconflicted it. And by that, we mean she's gone through and thought of all the things that could come up. 
what if what about this when somebody asks you about the the lie that she's telling what about this part of it well here's what i here's what happened there and she's thinking about all these things she can go ahead and not have answers or stories ready for prepared for as they as they begin questioning her questioning her now as she goes through these and there are questions that she wasn't prepared for the whole thing starts to wobble a little bit and starts to break down and this is where we're, we're seeing the changes begin in her body language the stability of, of of not only her story but of her body language breaks down we see the movements increase as she starts scooting around especially there at the end she does that little scooch movement and her patterns we, we're going to see these patterns of behavior emerge we're going to see things she does over and over and over there are parts where we know she's telling the truth and parts where we, where we know she's obviously not telling the truth, where she's being deceptive, where she's lying. And we'll, we'll be able to tell very easily when she's telling the truth compared to when she's not. As, and we'll, as we go through, we're all going to point those things out. But that's the main thing to watch. This is a great study. And, and seeing someone, once you know what all of her, her cues and tells are, and there are just about nine of them, once you see all those, you'll say, oh, I see that happening. So we can put this in the pile. It doesn't mean she's lying. doesn't mean she's telling the truth. It just suggests that there's an issue there. And you put that little piece of information in your pile of, I think she's not telling the truth. I think she's being deceptive. Or I think she did this, um, this crime or whatever she's been accused of. Why didn't you make an attempt to locate it and mark it for the police like you did the ghost gun? I stumbled across the ghost gun when I was packing. That's why I marked the box. In my mind, I had a list of things I thought the police might come back and ask me for, and I thought the ghost gun would be among them. Do you see the irony in not being able to locate that and that being the allegation that that was the murder weapon? You know, I see nothing ironic about this case at all. I see nothing happy about this case at all. It is true that nobody actually told you that it was Dan that had been killed until Detective Posey, correct? Yes. Okay. And that was during that interview? Yes. Okay. But you stated that Karen called you before you went into that interview. Yes. Dan's mother, Karen. Yes. And that you told her that it was Dan and that he was dead. Yes based on the fact that you thought that Dan had been killed? It was more than think. But you hadn't been told? I had not been told, but I had not heard from him. All of his friends avoided looking at me, and the police officers knew who I was before I got there, and one police officer hugged me. This is not good news I'm going to hear. What if you were wrong? Then I would have called Karen and said, happy days, I was wrong. And Karen and I would have celebrated and we would have laughed and we would have had family jokes about this for 20 years and it would have been much, much better than it turned out. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, a couple of areas of potential deception here and I'll let you go back and take a look at where they are. But look out for vocal clicks. That's when... This happens, there's one right at the start, and there's one maybe, let's just say, around halfway through. You'll, you'll find them. And then we get something very different happening with her eyes at the same time. The first time with that vocal click, we get a, an eye block. She just closes her eyes. Again, none of that means that somebody is lying or being deceptive, but it's out of baseline of what we saw in the earlier video where you know she's she's comfortable um, and her and and here. Uh, she's deviated from that baseline. Uh, vocal click uh, about halfway through, and then her eyes deviate up, and I think to her uh, left, I think. Now, I'm not going to go into what that might mean in terms of the thought process, simply that it's enough difference from how her eyes normally are that I would go, well, there's something definitely going on here, which is out of the ordinary, out of the norm. So two points there. Um, you know, one thing, one question that I have that I'd like answered, what, what's the headphones about? I, I dream and imagine that she's listening to Fleetwood Mac at this point. I don't know why Fleetwood Mac. I'm just picking <laughs> Fleetwood Mac. I, I think it'd be nice to be listening to, to, to Fleetwood Mac uh, at, at, this, at this point. She seems to be a kind of a Fleetwood Mac kind of kind of lady. Uh, but anyway, if anybody can tell me why she's got those headphones in, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? 
All right. Maybe it's the, maybe it's hard to hear from because they're so far apart. They plugged her in to hear what's happening. That's like, the only thing I can figure out. Because no, she she's those. hard of hearing. She is hard of hearing. So they they gave her that early to make sure she could hear. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. 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 Yeah. Well, I think this is a great a great example of a prepared answer with a plethora of extra information that has nothing to do with what's going on. It does, but it doesn't. Um, it, it's like when somebody tells you a ghost story, and when I hear ghost stories, there are some I hear and I go, I really believe they saw something. Or I'm not saying I believe in ghosts. I'm just saying something happened to that person. Then you have that person who sets up the entire scene. They go through and tell you step by step. And they set up where things were in the room and those kind of things. The person who actually did experience something, in my opinion, they come in and go, dude, I saw a ghost. Go tell me about that. We're standing right here and this thing walks out of the closet. They don't go through, oh, we walked, we were outside and we walked in and give you a reason they're there. She's adding all these qualifiers to her answer. This is one of the things that lets us know or suggests that something's up here. Something's not right about what she's doing. As it goes through, we see her blink rate increase, increase a little bit. Her head movements and, and her head gesturing increase a little bit. No real big illustrators or anything at, uh, up, up till now. Her volume is strong and, and becomes stronger as she goes along. She use, uses a lot of the one, one word answers when she's get when she knows the answer is yes or no or whatever. She's boom, boom, does those. That's fine. Um, that's squiggling her seat at the end. That that, in my opinion, would be she's saying I'm finished, and there it is. There's there's what I prepared. There's my there's my story. The only thing she doesn't say is and I'm sticking to it. She tries to, but she changes it as she goes along, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, these first three questions are showing us something unusual here. In question one, which she would not have to cognitively even process, we're seeing artificial cognitive processing, which I made that term up. And this is where she's moving her eyes to access a, a memory while pausing and hesitating, uh, which is inappropriate for this question. But she's learned this behavior is a time buying device. So she may throw it in at inappropriate times because she's not sure she's sure that it buys time, but not how. In question two and three, we're seeing something I call immediate mouth closure. And this is where she shuts her mouth and her lips close right after her answer. This does not mean deception per se, but when it's a deviation from baseline this far, it's a lot more likely to indicate deception. But there's one other time. Uh, you're likely to see a spike in this behavior. And this is when we're being confronted or questioned by an adversarial or maybe a confrontational person. We're more likely to see this lip closing behavior. So keep that in mind. There's some context to this. And there was this thing of I would have called heavy uh, Kelly and said, oh, happy days. I was wrong. Her head is now vacillating between shaking and nodding. And this is an incongruence signal that the brain isn't fully sure how to display a behavior. The emphasis here is on the word display. I didn't use the word express and emotion or convey a story. This is a conscious display and the brain is under stress here. And this is called cognitive load, how much stress is on the brain. And the things that are adding to this here and the stress, the deception, the perception management, Stress, deception, perception management, an adversarial interview, the presence of cameras, managing nonverbal expressions, her cognitive load is why we're seeing her body disagreeing with itself. It doesn't mean her cognitive load is excusing her deception signals, but we're seeing a person under a high degree of cognitive load aside from also having to be deceptive. Just wanted to point that out. That's all I got. And I was just waiting on you, Greg. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so let's walk through a few things. We we are all seeing a lot of the same things. Number one, yes. Pay attention to the way she says yes. Yes, yes. Sometimes she'll say yes. Yes is a tool for her. It's not a word. It's a tool. It's a delaying technique. It's a way for her to say, I'm going to accept that. No, I don't accept this. Pay attention throughout here. That's number one. Number two, when she breaks eye contact, I would usually say, yes, she might be trying to think, but she isn't because when we find her later going to retrieve data, it's the opposite side of her head. This is a this is a an avoidance eye move, access, exactly what you said, Chase. She's getting away from it, so she dart, darts this way. I don't think there's any thought process at all. I think it's a break. If you really want to pay attention, Mark, I think when he starts to put her on notice with this question, 
is when I hear that first pseudo click. It's hard to hear, but she does it for sure. There's an interesting couple of things going on here. That head bobble. I, I said in my notes, you guys know who Doris Roberts is? Famous actor. She looks like a bobblehead of Doris Roberts sitting there doing and bobbling her head around. And it'll get more pronounced as she gets less and less certain. It's really powerful to watch. She's got disdain and disapproval on the side of her mouth and some outright contempt. That left lip is almost quivering. She's so contemptuous of him when he's asking that one question. I think here's the problem. There's a lot of stuff you can prepare for when you're deconflicting. What person sits around in their house and comes up with an excuse for why they told the mother her son is dead? How, how could you come up with that? Okay. Hey, I think something's wrong. Your son may be injured. Something's wrong. That, okay. I got it. Your, your son is dead. How do you, how do you come back from that? There's not a place you go from that. So no matter how much deconflicting she's had, when she's sitting there, we see that head bobble because I think, to your point, Chase, there's no rational way she can deconflict that. All the time she's rolled things around in her head, and then she does that elevated blink rate right after the question, and then she does kind of that chained elephant in the chair. The good thing is, as we age, we get less and less active. We use our shoulders less and less. So it gets easier for people to hide things. However, She's not hiding because she shuffles around the chair and, and gets comfortable. It, it is true that nobody actually told you that it was Dan that had been killed until Detective Posey, correct? Yes. Okay. And that was during that interview? Yes. Okay. But you stated that Karen called you before you went into that interview. Yes. Dan's mother, Karen. Yes. And that you told her that it was Dan and that he was dead. Yes. Based on the fact that you thought that Dan had been killed. It was more than think. But you hadn't been told. I had not been told, but I had not heard from him. All of his friends avoided looking at me. And the police officers knew who I was before I got there. And one police officer hugged me. This is not good news I'm going to hear. What if you were wrong? Then I would have called Karen and said, happy days, I was wrong. And Karen and I would have celebrated and we would have laughed and we would have had family jokes about this for 20 years and it would have been much, much better than it turned out. Did you literally just say that was for the police's benefit? That was literally what I said. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. For and what? I well, I sort of thought that if the police didn't find something, they would want to come back and re-interview and I would be able to show them things. I thought the fact that all they had was Stan's uh, phone and not a computer from us might not, had, they may have reached a dead end and said, Mrs. Brophy, is there anything you can give us that would help? Any electronic equipment, anything else? So I was kind of in my mind making a list. I At that point, silly me, since I believed I didn't kill my husband, I didn't think I was a uh, witness, a uh, serious uh, suspect. Despite you telling people that you were. I told people I was a suspect because it's always the wife. All right. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is going to be a good one. I think one thing in here, she almost accidentally calls herself a witness instead <laughs> of a suspect, which I think is weird. But there's an even bigger one here. And this is the phrase, I believed I didn't kill my husband. I believed it. It's not that it's a fact. It's just a belief that she has. And, and right here, there's a single shoulder shrug just before this. There's a strong increase in her loss of fluency here. Her cognitive loads up because there's some deception going on, most likely. And you can see this with the sudden shift in posture and hand hiding and an eyebrow raise for special approval for this thing right here. There's just a there's a ton of stuff in here. I'm sure you guys will will unpack. Scott. All right. Now we're starting to see things change a little bit. We're seeing uh, bigger illustrators. We're seeing her hands come up and using those as, as her illustrators are, are the way your brain emphasizes specific words or phrases. And that's the way we, that's what we're talking about when we all say illustrators. Uh, and this is because she's confident and prepared for this. She's thought about this, this question. I'm sure her attorney brought this question up. And so she's ready for it. She's got her answer. And so she delivers it. Now, She's expecting the police to come back. 
That's why she's ready for this, because she knows they'll be back, because she knows there's nobody else out there that killed this guy, because it was her. So she's ready for that. And when she's deconflicting this, he starts ask, asking other questions that she's not prepared for, just like he did in the, in the other ones. And there's an imbalance with her body language at this point, because her indignance and her body language aren't saying the same thing. Her being her being indignant and all, it should her head should come forward with her eyebrows knitted like this instead of up and back like this as she's being in, indignant. That suggests more arrogance than indignance at, uh, for this, where it should it should be different. So that imbalance there lets us know that she's actually stepped in something and it's and she's trying to get out of it and to have a little problem getting away. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So look, I mean, if we didn't know that she would killed her husband, I mean, or, or, or at least, you know, she'd been convicted of that. The first two videos, you'd probably be kind of interested in. But by the time it comes to this third video, you are kind of, oh, well, yeah, clearly, because there is such a, a, a mass of signals that suggest uh, deception and and the questioning at that point has got more um, incisive. So look, there are a there are a number of pronounced single shoulder shrugs. However, just to your point, Chase, there is one that comes. It's actually a little bit smaller than the other pronounced ones, along with a a, t a tongue jut as well, which we often um, put alongside the idea of kind of pushing food out of your mouth. Something something is distasteful. Something isn't good about what's going on. There's an adapter there stroking the back of her hand that comes at the same time. That The head springs back at that point. There's lip compression as well and and a loss of fluency uh, in that the, the words and the ideas become more staccato. It's not fluid anymore and all of this around i didn't think i was a serious suspect so clearly we'd put alongside that yeah you did think you were a very serious suspect in fact you were the only suspect because you know you did this uh chase what do you got on this one greg what do you got oh hang on. yes perfect yeah Greg, what do you got yeah. So guys, you cover most everything I have. And Chase, I was right on with you. The same things. The single biggest shoulder shrug I may have ever seen in all these shows we've done was when she was saying that after that, so I could find it again. However, I don't think she stumbled into this. I think she used a very artful tool. She used a provocative statement saying, I labeled the boxes so I could find them later for the police, hoping that he would step into her iterative storytelling. Look, guys, I would say if you're a lawyer and you're trying to decide whether to put your person on the stand or not, and you're not sure, call us. This is not a good move because this is one hour. All of this video we're going to show you came out of one hour. She's on the stand for many hours. What she does is she starts to iteratively storytell, and she's selling the hell out of what she's written in this manuscript that she plans to talk about this. So she's comfortable until a couple of things start to fall away. And then you're dead. The other one I love, Chase, is that when she says, I believed I was not, didn't kill my husband, I believed. Then there's a lot of movement, stammering as she starts to say that. And then she goes to a uh, 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 serious suspect. That's her brain playing squirrel in the road, moving around. But because she's older, she doesn't move as much. She doesn't stammer quite as rapidly. She doesn't move quite as much as a younger person might. And then at the very end, there's a silent mouthing again. She goes, Somebody who can read lips, if you could tell what she's saying, please write it in the comments because she does it several times in here. I think it's for the good of counsel, not sure, but she also has hearing issues, so don't know. But yeah, this is a really starting to come apart story. And if you felt like you had a good candidate to put on the stand, you don't know what you're doing. Call us. That's it. Did you literally just say that was for the police's benefit? That was literally what I said. I marked the box for the police's benefit so that I could find it again when the police came back. For and what? I, well, I sort of thought that if the police didn't find something, they would want to come back and re-interview and I would be able to show them things. I thought the fact that all they had was Stan's uh, phone and not a computer from us might not, had, they may have reached a dead end and said, Mrs. Brophy, is there anything you can give us that would help? Any electronic equipment, anything else? So I was kind of in my mind making a list. I, at that point, silly me, 
since I believed I didn't kill my husband, I didn't think I was a uh, a uh, serious uh, suspect. Despite you telling people that you were. I told people I was the suspect because it's always the wife. Right. So you think you have relevant evidence to a, a murder investigation and you don't think you should mention it to the police? How does a gun kit, even though I marked it, how is a gun kit relative evidence? I'm asking you. I'm asking you because I don't think it is because it's never been put together. Then no. why would you mark it for the police? Because I figured the police would come back and want to know. What, what else did you think was relevant to the police investigation that you marked and did not share with them? Uh, I thought they would want, eventually want to know about the computers. They thought they would eventually want to go through the computers and see what they could uh, find, if anything, that would help them. And did you give them a, a computer that belonged to Dan? No. We had a computer. They never asked for it. But in my mind, I knew they would eventually... If they didn't solve the case by somebody coming in and confessing, they would eventually come back and say, can we see your computer? My computers weren't packed because I thought they were relevant to the police if the police wanted to go in that direction. Well, that's not exactly true, right? I mean, you had a computer in storage. No, I had a computer in a box in one room and a computer by the bed in another room. That's not in storage. Right, one in a box in your room. What about the one that was in the storage unit? There was not a computer in the storage. So there wasn't a laptop in the storage unit? There was not. Okay. What your testimony, what your guys' testimony was, they found the computer in a bedroom and they found the computer in a box in the other, in, in this, what had been the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would agree then that the stuff that was found on the computer that has been shown here in court was on the computer that was packed away in a box? Uh, I think that's how they, they did it, but, you know, it, it were the two computers. Why did you get a new computer in March of 2018? When you open the computer, the old computer, you can't read the screen because it's become lines across it. So you did all your research of all these guns on one computer, then packed that away and put it in a box in the closet, and then you got a new computer. Is that right? I get a new computer every year. I take a computer with me when I go out to the fields. I beat a computer up. I buy a fairly inexpensive computer because I know I'm replacing it the next year. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, things are starting to heat up a little bit for her. And the attorney's question is, is, she is presented as an attack, in her view, anyway. That's why we see that little, where she kind of shuts up and it, you can see her pop up during that. Um, because when he says that the gun, when she says the gun kit wasn't evidence, oops, sorry, it's my phone. Um, her movements in, that we see increase from from everywhere, from her head to her to torso to her hands. Everything's moving at this point, and her seat adjustments and and are are getting a little bit more uh, more common, I guess you'd say, as to what she's doing as far as her baseline goes. They're becoming a, the, the what was before not a part of her baseline. Now, as she gets stressed. That is a part of her baseline. Earlier, we talked about how we can see the differences when she's telling the truth and when she's she's being deceptive. When she's telling the truth, her answers are really short, and her words aren't aren't very long. Like we talked about earlier, one word, two or three words here and there. And when she's not being honest, when she's being deceptive, we get these really long sentences. These really long, and there's a little a little comma and and, and she'll add stuff and and she'll add stuff. The answers just get filled with these qualifiers and things to help her, her story sound more believable. Um, then she locks down after all, after all that she locks down and her voice cadence and her, and her tone changes, everything starts to change there. And then her baseline suggests, um, well, I've just gone over that part. So the fading facts part is when she says, uh, there was no computer in the storage unit. When she says that, it starts getting quieter. Earlier, she connects with her her attorney. She turns her head and her eyes, she knits her brow and she looks at her attorney like that, like she's trying to see what her attorney is either saying, mouthing to her, or is signaling to her. Because I know what that looks like. And she does that and looks, and you can tell she's trying to see what's happening over there. So that's where all of her attention goes. Um, and the second time she connects with him, she says... Um, in my what? She goes, in my what? That's what she's doing at that point. Because uh, I asked somebody who's pretty good at lip reading, and I said, what does this look like to you? And they said, it looks like she's saying, 
in my what? So if you look at that, it looks like she's saying in my what? So he's, he is telling her again where they found another computer or they found one of the computers she didn't bring up or something related with that. I can't, of course, I don't know because we don't know what he's thinking or she's thinking. But she says, in my what? So I, I think she's against the wall and she starts swinging. And that's why she's getting so stressed. Greg, what do you got? You want a good indicator that she's against the wall. She starts off doing something I always refer to as sacred space. <clears throat> what I mean by that is I create a barrier, give myself some space, and then I adapt. And guys, when we talk about adapters, a barrier is simply putting something either figurative or real between the two of us. Then a barrier, I mean, then an adapter is a way to release nervous energy. More importantly, in all my time of dealing with prisoners, I would tell you that what we do is whatever we always have done in the past that makes us feel more comfortable, whether it's playing with our nails or twirling hair, or tugging at your ear, all of those things are make known from the unknown. So if I lock you in a cell and you do that, it, it there's some familiarity there. And she's doing that. She's got her body crossed and she's either massaging or gripping her opposite arm. That's a great indicator something's up and her respiration's up. Watch the scarf. There's uncertainty with you, Scott. She had uncertainty in her face as she's looking for that answer. When she said, how is the gun kit relative evidence? She's provoking him to come back at her. She's probably got something prepared to say, no, it was this and this and this. So she's ready for it. I, I don't think there's a whole lot other than that in that back and forth with the, with counsel. Again, if you are an attorney and you put her on the stand, you're not thinking about what's possible. Because she's deconflicted to the point she's going to spew information at every turn, that creates the opportunity for her to ramble. He asked a great question. What else did you mark? But she doesn't give a great answer. She rambles on about computers. She draws her head away twice in this interview, draws her head away in avoidance, but keeps eye contact, that kind of pulling taffy move. Point those out. Tell me what she's doing in those down in the notes. And I, I, I'm glad you had a lip reader look at this because that's one of the places I was looking. When she gets in a bind and she's up against a wall, she is a master of chaff and read to write because she's got storyline hooks. People who write stories have hooks that are old maxims for them to be able to throw out and redirect and go around you. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I think if I was uh, the prosecutor here, I would start by reading her books and see every mistake the police made and how the bad guy was able to evade the police. I bet there's a trend. I have not read her books. I'm willing to bet that there's a trend to that. It's just something I was randomly thinking about there. But in this video, let's use the old classic reasonable person standard on this one. A reasonable person who knows they didn't commit a murder would not refer to things in their house as evidence that the police would be interested in, maybe, and the police being interested in weapons that were not involved in the crime is something a guilty person might assume. They might be interested in this weapon, but definitely not that other one. So I think this, this gesture here can show us something for training purposes. When she demonstrates opening the computer to show the lines across the screen, there's something unusual about her, her baseline. She uses body narration all the time, which is when we illustrate a story, like I'm talking about a giant building, my hands go up, I'm talking about putting something together and I do this. She does it all the time, but when she does this, it's in a way as if she's opening the computer toward the prosecutor, and she even holds the screen up for him so that he can see the lines across the computer. I don't see this often, and I think it's truthful that she did at one point have a computer that had these lines on it. So in the future, with her very vividly illustrating these things with her body, we might be able to look for situations where illustrations should be there and they aren't and you'll see that in a couple videos and i'm not going to tell you where it is i want to see if you can spot it leave it in the comments and we'll check it out mark yeah so yeah we have had some some illustrators and it, it's great when you watch this on video because there is one thing that remains relatively constant in this video which is the how big the frame is and so we can tell uh, how her illustrators might get small or get amplified now in this situation here her illustrators start going right out of frame so you'd know like for me because i do illustrate 
quite a bit. You've probably noticed that about me. But because I can see an image of myself, I'm able to keep them pretty much in the frame. This one naturally goes out because that's how I set up my camera, that the, the, the gesture will pop in and out. But this one really should never leave the frame. So if ever I start leaving the frame with my gestures, you'd kind of go, oh, Mark's pretty much lost control of being able to monitor him, himself right now. Something is very, very different. Now, she doesn't know her frame, but we do. And so we do know when she points out and goes out of frame, something has very much changed for her. She's really trying to overemphasize for us. She's really protesting a little bit too much, I would say, about the computer being in a box over there and not hidden evidence of any sort. Uh, then we get, um, oh, then we get these gestures of, of um, a single finger and then a, a thumb as well. I think a single thing, finger and a thumb. Again, she does gesture quite a bit, but she's usually fairly locked down. We get that and then we get this demonstration of the computer as well. It really feels like she wants us to buy into all of this. So this would be an area where I'd want to know more about. I'm, I'm intrigued. Like, what is it about? about I don't know, know nothing about this case, but this would be where I would be really interested. Why do you really want me to believe all this stuff about computers being where they should be, but at a distance and packed away and computers being broken? Like, why is that in, so important? Why do you need to demonstrate that in such a big way that you would break your usual baseline? Do you think you have relevant evidence to a, a murder investigation and you don't think you should mention it to the police? How does a gun kit, even though I marked it, how is a gun kit relative evidence? I'm asking you. I'm asking you because I don't think it is because it's never been put together. Then so, why would you mark it for the police? Because I figured the police would come back and want to know. What... What else did you think was relevant to the police investigation that you marked and did not share with them? Uh, I thought they would eventually want to know about the computers. I think thought they would eventually want to go through the computers and see what they could uh, find, if anything, that would help them. And did you give them a, a computer that belonged to Dan? No. We had a computer. They never asked for it. But in my mind, I knew they would eventually... If they didn't solve the case by somebody coming in and confessing, they would eventually come back and say, can we see your computer? My computers weren't packed because I thought they were relevant to the police if the police wanted to go in that direction. Well, that's not exactly true, right? I mean, you had a computer in storage. No, I had a computer in a box in one room and a computer by the bed in another room. That's not in storage. Right, one in a box in your room. What about the one that was in the storage unit? There was not a computer in the storage. So there wasn't a laptop in the storage unit? There was not. Okay. What your testimony, what your guys' testimony was, they found the computer in a bedroom and they found the computer in a box in the other, in, in the, what had been the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would agree then that the stuff that was found on the computer that has been shown here in court was on the computer that was packed away in a box? Uh, I think that's how they, they did it, but, you know, it, it were the two computers. Why did you get a new computer in March of 2018? When you open the computer, the old computer, you can't read the screen because it's become lines across it. So you did all your research of all these guns on one computer, then packed that away and put it in a box in the closet, and then you got a new computer. Is that right? I get a new computer every year. I take a computer with me when I go out to the fields. I beat a computer up. I buy a fairly inexpensive computer because I know I'm replacing it the next year. And you would agree that you also never told the police about the slide and barrel that um, you purchased on, e e on eBay? Mr. Overstreet, when I talked to the police, when I talked to the police in June, they asked me specific questions. My husband had just died. The fact that I was coherent at all is a miracle. The fact that they never came back to me after that for a follow-up interview, I think thought was shocking. You know, I thought this was on the police. This wasn't on me. The police said, we're handling this. You just go home and rest. You know, you go home and take it one day at a time, you know. And they never contacted me again, except 
for the things that I they asked me for, which was Dan's schedule. I got that to them, and I was having trouble with their email, but I did what I was asked to do. Are you declining to answer my question? Perhaps not. What was your question? That was a lengthy answer for not remembering my question. Well, I go off on tangents. So I asked you, is it true that you did not tell the police about the slide and barrel? It is true. I did not tell the police about the slide and okay. barrel. The slide and barrel that fit, would fit perfectly on the gun show gun that you purchased. The slide and barrel that I was using for research for my writing. I did not tell them about that. You can answer that question? I did. I said I did not tell them. Would you agree that it fit on the gun that well, you bought from the gun it show? It was the same thing. It could have been interchanged, yes. All right, Chase, what do you got? Let's just take a quick walk together, shall we? through everything that goes on here and just her response to this this question. We have hesitancy, a use of the interviewer's name, which is out of baseline. It's not like she says that all the time. There's phrase repetition. There's severity softening. There's died instead of killed or, or murdered. They're shifting the topic of questionable be behavior to the police. And there's questionable behavior to the police. There's projecting responsibility to the police. Once, and then it happens again, there's a partial resume statement. There's a large body movement for adaptation or self-soothing behavior right after the exchange. And if you were to just use the behavioral table of elements to score this, Mark, uh, I know this is your favorite, this scores a 36. And just for reference, an 11 or higher is a high likelihood of deception stress. So we have a 36 here. Pretty big. Greg? Yeah, it's because it's prepared. I, I think you can't miss that this is prepared. This is one of her tripwire things. If I come in and I'm prepared for a given thing and I've got a packet of information I need to spill out, then it comes across as not genuine. It just, you know anybody can see that it's not genuine. You don't need to be us to see this is not genuine. She changes cadence. She goes away from saying things in this rapid succession she's done. She goes, Mr. And you're right, gets to be very polite and overly helpful. Again, best indicator for me when somebody's overly helpful and polite and they're in a bind, something's up. She goes, calls him by his name. And then she goes into this whole pitiful story about what happened to her. There's a pause in her speech and in her movement, and then the repeated words when she says, I'm talk, I talked to the police, she's heating up. This is packaged. All that stuff we talked about in the beginning about deconflicted data, this is deconflicted data she sat on. The problem with deconflicting is you can only deconflict what you know is coming. So all the elements of the story she can deconflict. What she can't deconflict is the attorney asking a pointed question and poking her. And that's when you see it start to heat up. She says, never contacted me again, talking about the police, and then she... Uh, cadence shifts, she shuffles and corrects the record in mid-sentence. All those canned elements are her friend, and this is easier for her than it would be an average person, in part because she's slower moving, in part because of the way she moves and talks. Then her the when he says, you're going to answer my question, you're trying to avoid my question, her eyes narrow. She's frustrated with him over that, and she says, perhaps not. She talks so far down the path, she lost herself is the problem. So then she has to come back and try to answer it. And she conditions that slide and barrel question to avoid agreeing with him about the incriminating characterization of it. Because yes, in fact, that is the element of the entire story. If you're writing a criminal story about killing somebody and doing away with the barrel and slide, you would know that's the evidence piece that matters. And as she gets there and she starts to try to get away from it, you, to, you call it losing fluency, Chase. I call it their brain is like a squirrel in the road and they're trying to decide what's the next word. That's why, because they're just batting around. She can't come up with the next word, which is not like her because she is a storyteller. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yep. Chase, not surprised that it scored so highly. Here is the one thing in my mind that instantly shouts out that she is in trouble. And though she may have prepared this, just because you prepared it doesn't make it true. And therefore doesn't mean that you're not going to go under stress and pressure because your mind knows that you're making stuff up and you're lying and there is a risk to that. And so unless you're the type of personality that doesn't see a risk, 
at all or the risk is is low compared to most of us you're still going to feel that stress and pressure here's what happens we see her elevate her gesture and then it collapses and we hear the noise of the collapse now when I'm working with clients, I get them to take off jewelry, stuff like that, because I know the moment they get under stress and pressure, they'll start raising gestures and then collapsing and raising and collapsing and raising and collapsing. And if you're in a TV studio and you're at a news desk, the mics pick that up. And human beings on the other side, they don't know that that's what they get disturbed by, but they get disturbed by all this noise happening. So before a client goes into a studio, everything comes off even even buttons in some cases will take those off so again they're not rattling on the desk now uh we're going to see that a little bit later on as well where she makes uh even more noise around this so look out for that as a tell not only in her but in others that you're dealing with are they making a lot of noise because their gestures are becoming buoyant and then collapsing and buoyant and then collapsing scott what you got on this one all right. I think this is a great example of chaff and redirect because she chaffs and redirects so hard. She forgets what the, what the question was. She can't even tell what the question was. She goes, what? And then look at this and starts going over here and goes over so far. She, she's totally lost it. She's, she's, out, she's just out of her element at that point. Uh, and this is bad for her because even though she was ready for this, like Greg was saying, she wasn't ready for the, she was ready for the initial engagement. She wasn't ready for those shots to come after that. So she hasn't, uh, deconflicted for those. So it's, it's, it, it's just, it's sort of turned on her. We're seeing her get her, the fight is starting at this point for her. Um, her cadence starts speeding up a little bit and her tone and, vo and, and cadence of her voice are still strong. Everything's still going well and going well, but she, now she's in, in fighting mode. So you can tell from her respiration, the way she looks, the way she sounds, she's starting to panic because she just stepped in it one more time. All right. You good. Okay, Greg, I'll give you that. That was uh, very stoic of you. And you would agree that you also never told the police about the slide and barrel that um, you purchased on, e e on eBay. Mr. Overstreet, when I talked to the police, when I talked to the police in June, they asked me specific questions. My husband had just died. The fact that I was coherent at all is a miracle. The fact that they never came back to me after that for a follow-up interview, I think, thought was shocking. You know, I thought this was on the police. This wasn't on me. The police said, we're handling this. You just go home and rest. You know, you go home and take it one day at a time, you know. And they never contacted me again, except for the things that I they asked me for, which was Stan's schedule. I got that to them, and I was having trouble with their email, but I did what I was asked to do. Are you declining to answer my question? Perhaps not. What was your question? That was a lengthy answer for not remembering my question. Well, I go off on tangents. So I asked you, is it true that you did not tell the police about the slide and barrel? It is true. I did not tell the police about the slide and barrel. The slide and barrel that fit, would fit perfectly on the gun show gun that you purchased. The slide and barrel that I was using for research for my writing. I did not tell them about that. You can answer that question? I did. I said I did not tell them. Would you agree that it fit on the gun that you bought from the gun? It was the same thing. It could have been interchanged, yes. Uh, you just found out your husband died, and it's very hard to remember everything that you talked about in there. Mm -hmm. But you, didn't, you do recall that you didn't have any trouble telling them about the firearm that you had purchased at the gun show, correct? In fact, you told them the whole story about why and how you purchased the gun. Detective Merrill said, does Dan have any guns? Dan owned half a Glock. I told him about the full Glock. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, although I thought listening to that sentence, it came out snotty, which wasn't really the way I wanted it to come out. But what I will tell you is he asked me, I answered him the best way I knew how. Why didn't you just say, yes, we have a gun? I was trying to be helpful to the police at this point so they would know what was going on. You know, at this point, I thought they were going to find my husband's killer. I didn't think they were going to say, let's look at the one person who didn't kill him. But instead of just answering, yes, we have a gun and it's at home, you actually made sure to give them a full story as to how and why you purchased that gun. 
Mr. Overstreet, you are having trouble keeping me quiet now because I tell stories as I'm talking to you. Do you think I was less than that with the police when I'm upset? This is how I talk. I tell full stories to illustrate what I'm saying. Even though you were just informed of your husband's murder? Well, apparently it didn't make me quieter. It just made me more upset. All right. She looks like she's about two minutes away from saying, you boys get all your stuff and you get out of here right now. Everybody go home. Oh, yeah. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, um, I think, I think, I, I can't quite tell the eye line, but I think there's some uh, targeting of threat there. I think there's some maybe turning of pages by the um, by the lawyer and she clocks that and she's wondering what's in that, what's he got there. I think, though I could have the long, wrong eye line on this, but it, for me, looks like she's seeing a threat in in what he has in front of him. Um, she says, you know, and there I think we see Duper's Delight, which is where side of the mouth turns up. There's a, let's say it's it's a little bit like a wry smile. Uh, then then it also shifts a little bit later into what seems to be a, a full smile and then shading of the whole face. The eyes go, go down. But certainly for, from my point of view, Duper's Delight on the story that she is spinning on this one. So I'm open to uh, to other views on this. Greg, what you got on that? Yeah, I think it may be sarcasm mixed with that because I think she is, she's from Texas. You know, there's a whole lot of Southern woman going on here. And if you're raised by Southern women, you know, they can be very sarcastic and very dry when they lash out at you. So it could be that. But this one is interesting because it agitates her to the point that she does an entire seat correction. That's a big deal. That's the biggest movement we've seen from her so far. And then she goes into that overly helpful description again. If you want to know that she's going to go into overly helpful, her cadence, the space between her words gets much longer. She's going boom, 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 instead of boom, 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 boom. Interesting, her mouth starts moving before vocal cords engage again. I don't know what that's all about with her. Don't, don't get it, but maybe that's just how she's wired. But she goes into this logical to her explanation. She goes to a slow cadence. She goes, Detective Merrill said. Then she goes to internal voice, meaning she's looking down to her left. We typically associate that with having conversation with self and understanding exactly what we should say next, navigating minefields, that kind of thing. And she starts to characterize why she was deceptive about that gun. And look, there's no real reason. And I'm not sure if that's sarcasm or contempt or a duper delight or all of it mixed together, Mark, because she's this is a, there's a whole lot going on in this head. And then her, she gets real blink rate <coughs> increase, followed by some amusement as she characterizes this. But she is she says the full story. She's talking about telling a full story. She doesn't tell full stories. Guys, all the time when we talked in the past about people being iterative storytellers, this is the poster child for iterative storytellers. She throws out a piece for you to bite, and then she fills in the details so that she can redirect the entire conversation by iterative storytelling. Scott, what do you got? All right. This is a perfect example of what I call visceral protective reaction, because as soon as he brings up gun, she it hits her, her eyes widen a little bit, and she scoots up, and then she protects herself. She pulls her arms in front of her. This is, she could be. This this is a barrier, and it's an adapter at the same time. Uh, and this clicks her into freeze, fight, or flight. I think just a, a, a almost a hint of that we can see on her face. Uh, now she's up and she's swinging haymakers, man. She's trying her best because now she's in a big. She's in. This is the rough part of. It. This is where she's in there, where she's once again in a place where she. She had deconflicted, de but she didn't have everything perfect. She didn't go to the ends of it. She just got like you do in a book and do in a story. She got the big points. She got the major bullet points for it, but she didn't get the details on it. So when he keeps coming back, she's having to dodge, and then she swings real big, and he goes back like that and, and just tags her real good. I, I think the mouth grooming and that seat adjustment, nozzle adapters we're seeing uh, while he's talking, I think those let us know that she's angry for what the, all that looks like because – it, I think she's getting heated up at this point. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, totally agree. And one of the biggest mistakes people make, uh, to, to your point, Scott, is they rehearse monologues. And they're yeah, so man. comfortable with a monologue that they are confident when they walk in and they haven't done any rehearsal with someone who's adversarial. You have to do adversarial rehearsal. And 
That's that's the thing. They think, oh, if I just rehearse these monologues, I'm going to be okay. But I I developed a dispatch call screening sheet for 911 operators, which is free all over the internet. It's on you know social on my social media and all that stuff. But I made this for police, which you could download anywhere. There's 11 things on there that you can screen when somebody's initially interviewed by police, or when they make a, a 911 phone call to determine if they might be the guilty party. In this video, she hit five out of the 11 just from her own recall of the conversation with the detective. That's a big deal. So here, here they are, the five. There's a focus of conversation on the facts instead of getting help. Number two, information in the detail level was high, not low or average. So it's just a high detail in unusual places. Number three, the facts provided were more than necessary instead of the average amount. Four is repetition. She repeats phrases and questions instead of providing a lot of answers. And finally, when it comes to answers, she's hesitant instead of providing immediate and direct answers. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And so she would score high even on her own description of her conversation with the cops. Uh, you just found out your husband died and it's very hard to remember everything that you talked about in there. Mm -hmm. But you didn't you do recall that you didn't have any trouble telling them about the firearm that you had purchased at the gun show, correct? In fact, you told them the whole story about why and how you purchased the gun. Detective Merrill said, does Dan have any guns? Dan owned half a Glock. I told him about the full Glock. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, although I thought listening to that sentence, it came out snotty, which wasn't really the way I wanted it to come out. But what I will tell you is he asked me, I answered him the best way I knew how. Why didn't you just say, yes, we have a gun? I was trying to be helpful to the police at this point so they would know what was going on. You know, at this point, I thought they were going to find my husband's killer. I didn't think they were going to say, let's look at the one person who didn't kill him. But instead of just answering, yes, we have a gun and it's at home, you actually made sure to give them a full story as to how and why you purchased that gun. Mr. Overstreet, you are having trouble keeping me quiet now because I tell stories as I'm talking to you. Do you think I was less than that with the police when I'm upset? This is how I talk. I tell full stories to illustrate what I'm saying. Even though you were just informed of your husband's murder? Well, apparently it didn't make me quieter. It just made me more upset. Why would you pay cash at the gun show? Well, actually, that was Stan's idea. And uh, when we talked about it and what have you, he said, here's 400 in cash. Uh, you get cash from your thing. So I went on Dan's idea on that. Didn't you actually withdraw the $400? I withdrew the $400, but... It was, he gave me 400 in addition, and he gave me cash. Okay, I don't know that I quite understand that. Didn't you withdraw $400 from your on-point account? After he had given me the first 400. How did he give you 400? In cash. And where did that come from? Dan has cash at the house. Dan owns, operates a cash business. You know, he sells eggs. He sells a crap on the cart. He sells... Um, he operates with a lot of cash. Okay. So he gave you, and we'll talk about that too. Um, so he gives you $400. Mm -hmm. You then go to On Point and mm -hmm. withdraw $400. Mm -hmm. So you have $800 cash. I do. What did you do with the remaining $300? Well, it wasn't a remaining $300. Uh, as they were taking the gun apart to show me how it worked, they sold me, uh, but I didn't have a receipt on this, they showed, sold me... Uh, some oil that I they thought I was going to need. And in addition, I had bought a got book on Glocks in general. So uh, what did I do with the probably 200 plus, but not much plus? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I gave part back to Dan. That was a long time ago. It wasn't that essential to me. I have no memory of what I did with it. You didn't put it back in your bank account? Maybe Dan and I went out to dinner. Who knows? You know, but I could have just as easily given it back to Dan. Okay. Hi, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah. So, Jason, the last one, you talked about monologues, exactly what we say in deconflict, right? I sit, I, what we say is in the liar's loop, I start off with a trigger, then I fabricate, then I deconflict, then I pitch. And until I pitch, I don't know what people are going to tear me apart for. And then when they start, I have to defend that. And when I have to defend it, I have to internally, while I'm standing there, deconflict it, pitch it again. And we, what we try to do is force a person into the death spiral of a lie. So they're standing in front of you trying to fix something. She's getting there. She's getting there very quickly because listen to her cadence change this time. There's some red flag deviations here. When Earlier earlier places when she would tell, she would slow down and get methodical. Not here. She's hastening. She conditions the words with actually in the beginning. And then she tries to rush to tell you, actually, he gave me and she speeds up. She sits up straighter than she has in the past. And now her head's in full wobble. This is where I got the Doris Roberts. If you don't know who Doris Roberts is, go look her up. This is a Doris Roberts bobblehead doll. If you ever watch um, Everybody Loves Raymond, she was the mother there. That that character, she looks a lot like her, but she's got her head bobbling around so much now that it's really hard to look at her straight. And then her blink rate goes through the roof. And we know that blink typically indicates one of two things. A person's processor is heating up. They're trying to process information or they're under stress. And so there you go. And this is the first time we also see her do this self-embrace. She's tightening her body. She's hugging herself. And that's both a barrier and an adapter because she's probably pressing in her ribs and she's milling her hands at the convenient, I have no memory. That's her escape. That's how she gets out. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, he operates with a lot of cash, she, she says, and then she adapts and then covers primary sexual characteristics, which in her case would be uh, over is just down down here. That that I don't think we've seen her do before. She then drops her hands down a little bit further into her rest pose. But what I want you to look at is that initial covering of primary sexual characteristics, which does suggest there's some real heat around these particular questions or how she's trying to deconflict this with the, he, he runs a cash business. Um, I do, she says, and then there's sour mouth and vocal click as well. That's a good sign that, that uh, there's a lot of stress here. Uh, last of all, I, I think you're right. There's a lot of deconfliction going on here because we see her eyes scanning from left, right, left, right, left, right, as she looks for some kind of new story to occur quickly in her mind. Her brain is really trying to think uh, hard and fast here. And then we get a loss of, of fluency uh, in the, the, the rhythm of her, of the way she's creating uh, narrative changes dramatically. So uh, the heat's up for her. Her brain is on overdrive and it's not quite managing. And she's now starting to instinctually protect the most important organs in her body. Chase, what do you got on this one? I'm just going to walk you through the first half, just kind of the first half of this video. And I'm just going to tell you everything that goes on and you can find it later. I'm going to do it one at a time, I think in chronological order. If you'll forgive me if I make a mistake or two here, but they're all there. Number one, Mark, you called it loss of fluency when she's talking about her bank account using the ATM, which she doesn't say. Phrase repetition, single shoulder shrug at the source of the cash from Dan, information spike in unnecessary places, and missing detail in critical areas. This is a large disparity here in this clip. There's self-grooming immediately after talking about the source of the cash. There's an arm cross with, and behavioral hesitancy happening at the same time. So it's just like we have verbal hesitancy, we can have behavioral hesitancy where you'll see someone start to move and stop and maybe correct themselves a little bit. So that, that's what I might call behavioral hesitancy. Maybe there's a word for that. Uh, then there's a second reversed arm cross immediately after that, instantly after that, with increased behavioral hesitancy again. Then we get to, Mark, uh, you called it there, more genital, what I would call genital protective behavior. I'm just going to leave the second half alone completely. That was a mountain. I didn't even count it, but I'm sure the score would be well into 68.2 million, uh, <laughs> give or take. And Scott, what do you got? All right. This was, re this was prepared and well rehearsed. We know this because her voice starts lilting. 
So she hasn't sounded like this before. She's selling this at this point. She she was ready for this, but it sort of gets out of hand for her again. And uh, when she's asked the follow up question, this is the part where where like we've seen before, she goes through and everything's fine. It starts falling apart there. Um, she deconflicted it, but her barriers and adapters start showing up right after that, after that question or after she starts answering it uh, with her arms across her stomach and the whole thing. So she's not, again, she's not, she's prepared, but she's not prepared. It's a combination. And I think a lot of this is to blame on her attorney. Like, like you were saying uh, earlier, Chase, something's not right here. She's get, she's done this monologue and she's done it in her head. I don't think she's spoken this stuff out, but she's gone through the, the she's created these monologues and she hasn't run them by her attorney because her attorney would have said, well, hang on just a second. You can't say it like that. Don't do that. We're also going to start hearing uh, a proof that she's done that because her story changes as she goes along. She's thought about all these things. Everything's loose, but she's not zeroed in on it and gone, dang. Here it is. That's the line I'm going. That's my story right there. She keeps having to change it because she's she's getting new information from this other attorney. And she starts talking about the extra money. Oil for a gun, what is that, 12 bucks at the most? You know, if you get that the, the, the real fancy stuff, it's it's like $12. It's not much at all. And a book on Glocks, how many book, uh, books on Glocks are that they're going to have there that you go, oh, here's a book on Glocks you might like, you might find that interesting. That's going to be 20 bucks. So we're looking at thirty-two dollars, probably less than forty bucks, gone from that. And I don't, I don't think this went as well as she had hoped it it, it would go. So, all right, that's what I got. All right, Chase. I'd, see if you hadn't been chewing. Now, I'm, if you hadn't been chewing, it would have been perfect. But I'll give that one to you. I'll give that one to uh, you. Why would you pay cash at the gun show? Well, actually, that was Stan's idea. And uh, when we talked about it and what have you, he said, here's 400 in cash. Uh, you get cash from your thing. So I went on Dan's idea on that. Didn't you actually withdraw the $400? I withdrew the $400, but it was, he gave me 400 in addition and he gave me cash. Okay. I don't know that I quite understand that. Didn't you withdraw $400 from your on-point account? After he had given me the first 400. How did he give you 400 in cash. And where did that come from? Dan has cash at the house. Dan owns, operates a cash business. You know, he sells eggs. He sells crap on the cart. He sells, um, he operates with a lot of cash. Okay. So he gave you, and we'll talk about that too. Um, so he gives you $400. Mm -hmm. You then go to On Point and mm -hmm. withdraw $400. Mm -hmm. So you have $800 cash. I do. What did you do with the remaining 300 well, it wasn't a remaining 300. Uh, as they were taking the gun apart to show me how it worked, they sold me, uh, but I didn't have a receipt on this, they showed, sold me uh, some oil that I w they thought I was going to need. And in addition, I had bought a got book on Glocks in general. So uh, what did I do with the probably 200 plus, but not much plus? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I gave part back to Dan. That was a long time ago. It wasn't that essential to me. I have no memory of what I did with it. You didn't put it back in your bank account? Maybe Dan and I went out to dinner. Who knows? You know, but I could have just as easily given it back to Dan. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you didn't decide you didn't want it that day. That's right. You got it home. You took it. Did you handle it? Oh, sure. We both did. What did you do to handle it? Well, you know, we pulled it out and we looked at it. And I mean, how would I have known it was heavy if I hadn't held it? Uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, somebody testified earlier that there were two little dark hairs that were in the slide. In our house, who had two little short dark hairs was not me. You know, that would have been Dan. Uh, he handled it. Um, did you see him handle it? Yeah, it was right there. And what did he do with it? He looked at it. He picked it up. He messed with it. He pointed it toward the backyard. So, you know, even though it had no bullets in it. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't recall. We had a great conversation about it, but he definitely handled it. Did you ever remove the sign barrel? Oh, sure. I played with it. Oh, you did remove the sign barrel? Sure. Oh. I didn't think that was a secret. 
Well, you didn't tell the police that. The police didn't ask me whether I'd removed the sliding barrel. You told the police that you got it home and that you realized how much you didn't want it and you put it away and never touched it again. Do you remember that? I could have said that, but I was upset at the time. So that was probably an exaggeration. Uh, I handled the gun, you know, I may not have loved it, but I was still curious about it. And keep in mind, I'm writing a story about a gun and I need to research guns so I can have it. But yes, I didn't, you know, I touched the gun. Yeah. And so your testimony today, after hearing all the testimony and seeing all the evidence on the screen, your testimony today is that you have removed that side and barrel. I have. So you know how to do it. Yeah. It's not that hard, right? Oh, it's terribly hard. I broke two nails doing it. Don't believe them when they say it's not that hard. You can't just whip it off the way they do it. You have to hold the gun a certain way. You have to pull it back. I broke two nails pulling it back. And I thought, this isn't any fun. And uh, it, you would be shocked at how hard it is to do. You know, yeah, if you've hand handled guns all your life, I'm sure it's a piece of cake. But I can tell you, for me, it was not. All right, Mark, what do you got? I got a massive deviation from her usual baseline in just a stream of fillers, uh, which are, you know, the words that go in between other words that don't really have any job, don't really do much apart from fill space and maybe give you time to think about what you're saying and deconflict stuff or, or, or just spin your wheels because it's going badly. Yeah, here's just a few that I've got in the first 45 seconds. I stopped after a while. Uh, but we've got, well, you know, I mean, uh, um, and you know, you know, uh, no, uh, and, uh, and that's just in the first 30 or 45 seconds or so. Uh, what I did really love about this, she gives some kind of look off to the side and it has that look of, this is going so badly. <laughs> this kind of incredulous feeling about how badly this is going for her. I think she'd probably, as everybody's been saying, been organizing this in her head and somehow thought this could go quite well. You know, because she writes stories of, and uh, about murders, I guess, and she's probably got an idea that she might, you know, be some kind of Poirot-esque person who might be able to talk her way out of this. But <laughs> but, but it's going badly for her. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, man, Poirot-esque. Nicely yes. put. Yeah, <laughs> man. Okay, I think this is this, – this gets on my nerves because this is a – really dangerous situation for gun accidents because she's talking about playing with a gun she even says i played you know i i played with it that's not good that's how people get shot you don't have when a gun looks like a real gun it's not a toy you have to treat it like a gun like a loaded gun because someone may see the real one and think that's the quote unquote toy as, as she if she didn't refer to it here she refers to it in a couple minutes that's how people get shot that's how people get killed so and she says, when there are no bullets in it, I played with it. No, that that right there just flipped my whole thing to I don't I don't like her at all. Um, then he nails her when he brings up the, the the statement she made that she just contradicted. And that throws her off a little bit. Then she starts that hard chaff and redirect again. You know, that's all she and starts adding all this stuff. Nobody asked her how you break a gun down. Where did this come up? It didn't. She's trying to stay so far away from that from the question she's doing everything she can to stay away from it she's adding everything to it her aunt, again her answers are getting longer her her words are are spaced a little bit she'll speed up and slow down but her sentences are getting much longer as she tries to distance herself from all that uh from the from what she assumes is or sees to be the problem in that situation um ask, and then there's one more question that's where she starts she actually starts the the starts talking about the gun breakdown. It's just, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's what the way she talks and the way she views firearms is, is shameful. That's, that's horrible. That's the way people get shot. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed in people, when you're in an interrogation and you get to a point where you are up against a wall, when you're in a, tr in trouble, and if you get in trouble, you don't even have to be in an interrogation. You get in trouble with your spouse, you get in some altercation with your boss, what happens is people are in heightened fight or flight. They're panicked until they get back to some commonality, something they always do. It's why we adapt like all hell. We may play with our ring. We may do something. 
And look, I've watched many, many, many people in captivity and all those things they normally do just become more and more pronounced, kind of like putting somebody in a cage. Hers is chaff and redirect. She's a storyteller. She's a bullshitter. And she just goes on and on and on and on and on until she gets back to some comfort level. If you want to watch, Mark, I think you you nailed it right in the beginning. She's just spewing prepositions and ums and ahs until she can get to a point where she's got them asking her the questions that she's prepared for. That happens about 30 seconds in. Then once they start to bite on her hook, then she starts spewing whatever information there is. She's prepared. She's ready. Until he confronts her with that thing about saying she didn't want the gun. Watch your eyelid flutter and a slight eye roll. My guess is that eye roll is a pre- is a predecessor to altercation for her. And if she were not in this situation, we might see a little bit different her. She's back to that cadence with space between her words and large illustrators and telling again, toned down when I was writing a story. And then that bobblehead thing starts up again, pretty pronounced. And she makes immediate eye contact, immediate eye contact with her counsel right after she admits moving the slide. Then she goes back into that chaff and redirect to try to comfort herself. I would love interrogating somebody like this because you cut them off at every turn when they're chaffing and redirecting. And it raises their adrenaline levels all the more every time you do it. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I'll say uh, I agree with all of y'all. Y'all covered most everything here. And... This is a point where an interrogator could say, actually, this isn't correct. And you would just kind of disagree with one detail about her chaff story. Then you could see what a genuine denial will look like in the future. So disagreeing with something early on that they know to be true. Then you'll see what a truthful, genuine denial looks like. And you can see that uh, right away. So if he says, the slide does just slide off like that. And for the record, it does just <laughs> slide right off like that, for the record. But one thing I want you to see here in this video, you can see the precise moment. And if you want, type the timestamp in the comments. There's a precise moment in here when she goes off the cliff from telling to completely selling this whole thing. And you can see her go off the cliff. I want to see if you can spot it. Because it's a great little illustrator that's going to help to train your brain, not just for entertainment on YouTube, sitting here with your phone, but it'll train your brain for when you start seeing this in public. You're in a bar, you're at a networking event, you're at a job interview. You never know when you might need this kind of stuff. Seeing this transition is pretty important. That's all I got. Oh, Chase, that was good. It's very nice. Very nice. Okay, so you didn't decide you didn't want it that day. That's right. You got it home. You took it. Did you handle it? Oh, sure. We both did. What did you do to handle it? Well, you know, we pulled it out and we looked at it. And I mean, how would I have known it was heavy if I hadn't held it? Uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, somebody testified earlier that there were two little dark hairs that were in the slide. In our house, who had two little short, dark hairs was not me. You know, that would have been Dan. Uh, he handled it. Um, did you see him handle it? Yeah, it was right there. And what did he do with it? He looked at it. He picked it up. He messed with it. He pointed it toward the backyard. So, you know, even though it had no bullets in it. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't recall. We had a great conversation about it, but he definitely handled it. Did you ever remove the sign barrel? Oh, sure. I played with it. Oh, you did remove the sign barrel? Sure. Oh. I didn't think that was a secret. Well, you didn't tell the police that. The police didn't ask me whether I'd removed the sign barrel. You told the police that you got it home and that you realized how much you didn't want it and you put it away and never touched it again. Do you remember that? I could have said that, but I was upset at the time. So that was probably an exaggeration. Uh, I handled the gun, you know. I may not have loved it, but I was still curious about it. And keep in mind, I'm writing a story about a gun, and I need to research guns so I can have it. But yes, I didn't, you know, I touched the gun. Yeah. And so your testimony today, after hearing all the testimony and seeing all the evidence on the screen, your testimony today is that you have removed that side and barrel. I have. So you know how to do it. 
Yeah. It's not that hard, right? Oh, it's terribly hard. I broke two nails doing it. Don't believe them when they say it's not that hard. You can't just whip it off the way they do it. You have to hold the gun a certain way. You have to pull it back. I broke two nails pulling it back. And I thought, this isn't any fun. And uh, it, you would be shocked at how hard it is to do. You know, yeah, if you've hand, handled guns all your life, I'm sure it's a piece of cake. But I can tell you, for me, it was not. So you remove the slide and barrel. Yes. You can see that it's nearly identical to the ghost gun slide and barrel, correct? I'd have to look at both of them now, but I would say yes. Let's do that. Oh, yeah, we can look at that. Okay. I'm not going to hand these to you. I'll show them to you. Yes. You agree that these look nearly identical? I would agree that they look identical, but they obviously are not. One of them is quite a bit longer than the other one. Quite a bit longer. Which makes them not identical. When you're circling the little things on which find five things in this picture that aren't identical, you would circle that. Right. This one is slightly shorter. Yes. Block 19, ghost gun. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yep. So uh, as they start talking about, could you, you know, tell one from the other? We see her eyes move left, right, left, right, left, right. As she starts to deconflict, well, you know, how's that going to go? As to which way I go on this, she's got her idea of the story, but I don't think she was expecting this question. Uh, nice response from her. Well, you know, I'd, I'd have to take a look at that. And of course, yeah, he goes, okay, let's, uh, let's do that then. Well, though we don't see full surprise on her face, it'd be lovely if we did see that full surprise. Uh, what we do get is we clearly hear the intake of breath of surprise from her. She was not expecting that. I wonder whether that clocking of, of, of evidence at the start may be she saw that case on the table. I don't know. It'd be nice to see whether he reveals that case or whether that's been sitting on the table or all, all the way along. Don't quite know. Um, but anyway, she falls into a little bit of a, a trap there. There is surprise there. There's a redistribution of weight as well. Her whole body uh, shifts. There's a loss in fluency again. But the nicest thing I see there and look out for it is the side of the mouth goes up into contempt as the evidence gets produced. Uh, this is not good for her. She knows it. Lovely. Some great body language in that one. Greg, what do you got there? Yeah, so Mark, I'm not going to cover the same things you did because I love all those. Those are all beautiful, the way it all ties together. There's one other thing that shows her apprehension. Her forehead is up in the beginning. She's not talking. Her forehead's up in apprehension of what he's about to say. She, I think she can see the gun, and she thinks she'll just play it by ear and go, yeah, 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 no, I can't tell from here. And he calls her on it. I love that. There's adapting and barriering. She's crossing herself and milling at the same time. So she's trying to get comfort out of it. She tries to redirect and he calls her on it when she says, well, because that was her attempt to do what she does best, just to stammer about, well, I can't tell if they're the same size or not. They kind of look like it from here. There, you know, they're all black. By the way, if you don't follow the story yet, it appears that she bought a full blown gun that she was going to kill her husband with and bought a ghost gun, which is a gun you build, a gun kit that you build. And then the slide was the wrong size. She probably got the wrong kind of Glock. There are many different numbers and different kinds of guns. So then when that didn't work, she had to go out and buy a slide and barrel, a third piece. That's what the story is developing to. If you're not following that and you're not a gun person, what it means and the reason is because if I can dispose of the barrel, then you can't trace ballistics to me. It's not like there's a database of every bullet fired from every gun in the world and they just compare. So they have to find the barrel and then compare it to the round that was used. And that's how this works. So if you're not accustomed to guns, maybe that'll help. But she tries to redirect and run down that path and do what she does and chaff, chaff, chaff. But he stops her when he says, okay, we can. She goes, well, okay. Now her storytelling is gone. She's lost that ability. She becomes riveted on him and paying really close attention as he's moving, Mark, whatever he's doing at the table. Then she looks at counsel again. Then she goes back to telling again when he gets up and gives her the chance. She's saying, this is not like that, and this is not like that. And look, she even tries to make it 
personable. Look, if you had to circle what's not alike, I'd do it this way. She, she's a master of chaff and redirect at every opportunity to make her comfortable again. Uh, Chase, what do you got? At any possible point, watching these videos that we do every week, there's one single question that's on the top of my mind every single time, if it, if it could help you. What is being concealed? So what information is being left out that should normally be included in a regular situation? Where are the missing details and language that you would hear from a normal slash innocent person? In this clip right here, you're seeing her conceal what every human being would agree to, openly agree to. Her unwillingness to say that they look very similar is filled with just disagreement, detail picking, and argument. And this concealment of something so obvious that a normal person would agree with tells you everything you need to know. You can just use this when you analyze just about anything What's being disputed, concealed, left out, or brushed over? And that also goes into, is there a detailed mountain in one place and a detailed valley in another place, and they're in the wrong spots? So we see concealment by omission, and we see concealment here by just disagreement with tiny things. Scott? All right. Yeah, I've covered everything. So I'll talk about uh, Mark's, the key word, Mark, as you said, was trap. This guy's setting a trap. That's what we're watching happen. He's in front of her. He's just sitting there putting everything together. Uh-huh, uh-huh, talking to her, uh-huh, as he's putting this trap together. And so let's see if she walks into it. Oh, Greg, with a smile and everything. That's adorable. Oh, <laughs> so you remove the sliding barrel. Yes. You can see that it's nearly identical to the ghost gun slide and barrel, correct? I'd have to look at both of them now, but I would say yes. Let's do that. Oh, yeah, we can look at, okay. I'm not gonna hand these to you. I'll show them to you. Yes. Agree that these look nearly identical. I would agree that they look identical, but they obviously are not. One of them is quite a bit longer than the other one. Quite a bit longer. Which makes them not identical. When you're circling the little things on which find five things in this picture that aren't identical, you would circle that. Right. This one is slightly shorter. Yes. Block 19, ghost gun. <laughs> What else is not identical about this gun? Well, one, one of them obviously has a, a zip tie on it, but they are similar is what I would say, but they are not identical. Can you see the back? Yes. I agree they're similar. Can you see the top? I agree they're similar. I'm not going to point this at you, but can you see the, the barrel? I can. Okay. Anything about this side that is not exactly... I would ask you this as you're demonstrating this does it fit on the other gun no does that make it not identical yes and you knew it didn't fit right I knew it didn't fit because I uh, knew that I had a book on Glocks and in order for a Glock to work it had to work the right way you knew it didn't fit and then you bought a slide and barrel that would fit the gun show gun right no, I bought a slide and barrel that was the same one. I could have easily bought one that fit the uh, ghost gun, but I did not. I bought this one. Why would you buy another slide and barrel to fit the ghost gun when you couldn't build it? You already own it. You own this piece right here. You own this. Yes. So why would you buy another one? Uh, you know, if a trigger had been available, I would have bought a trigger. I'm telling you, I was fascinated with gun pieces at that point because I was writing a story on gun pieces and making it into a gun. There's a trigger in this kit. Yes, and I would have bought another one if I'd had it. I figured if I could construct them together the way the uh, character would have, it would have worked fine. But Miss Brophy, you didn't buy other gun pieces. You bought a slide and barrel that would fit this gun. 
That's true. No yeah. other pieces did you buy? No, but I wasn't finished shopping either. All right. Let me ask you guys something. How long do you think it's going to take for somebody to grab a gif of Greg doing that head bobble thing? I just think it's going to be two days or three days. What Who do you cares? Think? Who cares? Well, I care. <laughs> Watch it. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Okay, here we go. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so here now she is mishelpful. She's in a bind, but she even tries to be helpful when she gets to the trigger stuff. Up front, she knows she's in trouble. She knows she's got pieces she wants to avoid. As soon as she gets to the opportunity, she's going to try to avoid it and go away with non-pertinent information. Now, let me tell you, there's no such thing as non-pertinent information in an interrogation. When she starts talking about shopping for triggers, look, I would have said, hold, hold, hold on. I happen to know you can buy triggers all day for X number of dollars at this site. Did you ever go there? I would... Take that rope and run with it in an interrogation. But you really can't do that in front of a jury. So in front of a jury, he's got to illustrate that what she's saying is BS. And he does a pretty good job of it. She starts off trying to be mishelpful, saying, OK, this matters, that matters. Then she does one thing that's interesting. She's fed up with him, and it's clear. She does a quick inhale, deep, and leans back to excuse him, almost like if your grandmother was upset with you because you had done something wrong at her house on Thanksgiving, she went... You get the point. And I think she does that. She wants to move on because she's got other parts of this story written. She knows that she can talk about all this redirect with chaff and trigger and other parts. Although it's interesting, she doesn't bring up any other parts. If you were really, 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 really enamored of firearms, of pistols that your person might use, there's a lot more to talk about with a Glock specifically, not being the biggest Glock guy in the world. But there's a lot of stuff she could have talked about. There are other things she could have brought up to chaff and redirect, but she doesn't know that because she's only interested in that slide. She knew what a trigger is, and it's easy for her to say that. I think that's what I'm seeing. When she doesn't, I think she has a story to tell with those trigger and other shopping. And when she doesn't get that point across, I think there may be a narrative she's talked to her attorneys about. When she doesn't get it across, look at that quick, hard eye contact with her attorneys. I think there's something going on here. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is where she loses any control at all that she had had up to this point. And she knows he's up to something, but she's not really sure what, quite what it is yet. She's not really, doesn't really know. And then when it dawns on her what's happening, then she pauses and she readjusts and she starts uh, chaffing and redirecting again. Um, she takes a big, deep breath and she asks him a question, you know, because she's she, she doesn't know what to do next. Then she starts rambling and rambling and it's too late. He's already got her boxed in and there's no way out of it. And I think it's beautiful the way he handled that. Just got her. How many times have we, have we done that? You just get, you, you see it, you start talking to her. The next thing you know, they can't get out of the box and she can't get out. She's just squirming around in there. But then, then he walks away and let, and sort of lets her go, but he leaves, he leaves her in there all stuck in the box trying to talk her way out. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think part of the reason she was so off balance is is he's standing up and the the distance, their physical distance, which is the nerd word for that is called proxemics. So he's he's getting closer to her in her space. He's holding a gun and he's questioning her. And I think her attorney made her rehearse all of this. I think her attorney walked her through how to get out of this, how to kind of squirrel out of this thing. And I think she did a great, I think she thinks she did a great job because when she makes that hard eye contact with her attorney that you were talking about, there's a smirk. There's a tiny little smirk where she's like, huh, how about that? I did it. And you can see it right there at the end. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to add her, her out to my vocabulary of brilliant outs, which is, I wasn't finished shopping. I hadn't, hadn't finished shopping. <laughs> I mean, that, I, I just think, I think there's so many things you're going to be able to get out of with that. Mark, why were you in that secure area at uh, one o'clock? I, I hadn't finished shopping. Uh, you know, that's, 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 stuff. exactly, exactly. I think it's beautiful. Um, and, and just as you're saying, Chase, there's, is that wry smile afterwards and, she clearly laughs as well, because if you look at a diaphragm, you can see the diaphragm moving up and down in laughter. So she is loving uh, that line that she gave. I, I wasn't I wasn't finished shopping. Uh, maybe we'll do a T-shirt for anybody that, that, that wants it. I wasn't finished shopping. It's 
the best excuse I've heard in a long, long time. I'm certainly going to be using it in some very, very critical moments in my life. There, that's all I got on that one. I'm going to get out of speeding tickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll give that to you, Chase. Why were you doing 120 miles an hour? I wasn't finished. You committed. Yeah. Committed, even while the others were being Dude, unprofessional. Right in the middle of talking, man, you committed to it. it That's unprofessional. Weird. Well, I'm sorry, I wasn't finished. I wasn't finished shopping, Chase. You were... <laughs> <laughs> what else is not identical about this gun? Well, one. Um... One of them obviously has a, a zip tie on it, but they are similar, is what I would say, but they are not identical. Can you see the back? Yes. I agree they're similar. Can you see the top? I agree they're similar. I'm not going to point this at you, but can you see the, the barrel? I can. Okay. Anything about this side that is not exactly the same? I would ask you this, as you're demonstrating this, does it fit on the other gun? No. Does that make it not identical? Yes. And you knew it didn't fit, right? I knew it didn't fit because I uh, knew that I had a book on Glocks, and in order for a Glock to work, it had to work the right way. You knew it didn't fit, and then you bought a slide and barrel that would fit the gun show gun, right? No, I bought a slide and barrel that was the same one. I could have easily bought one that fit the uh, ghost gun, but I did not. I bought this one. Why would you buy another slide and barrel to fit the ghost gun when you couldn't build it? You already own it. You own this piece right here. You own this. Yes. So why would you buy another one? Uh, you know, if a trigger had been available, I would have bought a trigger. I'm telling you, I was fascinated with gun pieces at that point because I was writing a story on gun pieces and making it into a gun. There's a trigger in this kit. Yes, and I would have bought another one if I'd had it. I figured if I could construct them together the way the uh, character would have, it would have worked fine. But, Miss Brophy, you didn't buy other gun pieces. You bought a slide and barrel that would fit this gun. That's true. No I other pieces did you buy? No, but I wasn't finished shopping either. You were worried. You, I, your counsel said this. I don't know if you believe it or, or agree with it, but I'm going to ask you. You needed to buy that slide and barrel because you were worried about taking this gun apart? Yes. Okay. But you just testified that you took the slide and barrel off of it. That's not taking the gun apart. We're talking about if we took the slide and, bar the slide and barrel itself completely apart, could I put it back together and have a gun that wouldn't backfire on me and kill me? You know, and so the fact that when I said to Dan, I can take this gun, the real gun, not the kit play the gun, apart, and it'll help me do this. Dan said, no, 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 no. I've seen you in action. That's a mistake. Let's keep it together. We may get to sell it. I'm not talking about taking the entire gun apart. Okay. I'm talking about the slide and barrel. Yes. It's a critical piece of information. As you know now, if you didn't know before this trial, you know now the slide and barrel is what, is what it is that issue, right? Yes. You keep talking about the gun and taking it apart and all that. I'm talking about the slide and barrel. Mm -hmm. You have a gun complete, mm -hmm. slide and barrel intact. You know how to remove it. In fact, you did. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate the slide and barrel separate and apart from the rest of the gun. Mm -hmm. But you chose to buy the exact same piece. Is that right? Yes, but I have a caveat on that, too. Of course. Go ahead. The caveat I have on that was I wasn't thinking, hey, uh, this would work that way. I was thinking because for me, the gun was the gun, the toy was the toy, the pieces were the toy. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll be short on this one. She starts off with that same, she's using yes to box. Yes allows her to hurdle over whatever it is that you're doing so she can get to her next spot. That's the only reason she says yes. She does an emphatic yes in the beginning of this, which is a little interesting. Then she does her logical argument, just boom, 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 boom. And when she's doing the logical argument, you can see she's nodding her head and telling, and that bobbing, that bobbling head is gone. Then when she starts talking about Dan and him saying, no, you can't do that, the head bobble comes back, and she shows 
some frustration or disdain right in there. And there's exasperation in her voice when she says, I have a caveat for that too. And then she's got the most condemning withdrawal of the sides of her mouth as she's looking at this guy. When she tells a story about one was a toy and Scott, I know, bless your hot button. When she mm. starts talking about one was a toy and one was the other, then you get head bobble again because she's uncertain. So guys, we got really good baseline for what happens when she's uncomfortable. Chase, you pointed out very early that head bobble starts when she's uncomfortable with where she's at. When she's comfortable, she's got a head down. That yes is a framework. This is easy to box her in. I'd love to interrogate somebody who is this transparent. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so when she's saying like all of these pieces in the in the slide and barrel assembly, you have a slide and a barrel and this. This is the exact piece from a Glock, and this is what it looks like, and it takes less than a second to put in, and I think any human being could do this. So I think she is trying to inject complexity here. This isn't hard. So we're seeing another attempt that we see regularly to jam complexity and ambiguity into the story here, and I have to admit, I'm lost on this. She is way better at chaff than I think people might realize. And this behavior here is a deviation from normal for what we've seen her talk about that we know are facts. And the demeanor is defensive, concealing around something that should very much should be simple and easy to explain when something is simple. And a person usually communicates in a really straightforward way, and you see uh, an immediate spike in detail and explanation right here. There's excess information, information that is has no relevance to the, the question in the first place. And you're most likely seeing a lot of deception here. We see detail mountain in the wrong place, and detail valley in the wrong place at the same time. And that's what we're seeing here. Scott? All right. The, the reason that you, for what you're talking about, Chase, when you're hearing these things that don't that don't go with it and they seem out of place, is because she's a creative. She's a writer. It is she writes these long. She writes books. There, we know how it is to write a book. It takes a while. There's a lot of information there, but she has to be creative and create that story. She's very creative, so she, it's easy for her to on the spot create these small little stories and things. That's why there's so much information everywhere. That's why she keeps going on and on because she can think that stuff up really quickly, really quickly. There's nothing for her to, to make up a little story real quick. And she even said it herself. She tells things in stories. Remember earlier she said that. That's what's going on there. That's why she she does that. What irks the living out of me like you were saying greg is that she refers to to this gun as a toy guns are not toys there are no you have toy guns that are orange and all that as a kid but these things they'll kill you those things can kill you it's not a toy and when you think they're unloaded when i was raised my dad said look you got to look at guns like this they're they're magic because they can load themselves you can you can unload a gun, get up and go get a drink water and come back and could have a bullet in it. That's the way you have to think about those things. They have ammunition. In it. That's the way you got to think or somebody could get shot. It's not a toy. Never are they do you refer to a gun as a toy. If you can take a part of one gun out and put it in another one, which that's why she got that thing and it kills somebody. That's not a toy. That is a full blown gun. So you got to be I'm getting too up in this. I got to calm down a little bit. Sorry, Phyllis. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. That, that confusion between the two can get somebody killed. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, look, even if you don't understand what she's talking about because there's lots of chaff in there or it's, it's not a vocabulary used to, you can see that there's a lot more stress and pressure around her because up come the gestures, they're big again, and then they start collapsing again and we get two loud sounds on the table. That says to me immediately, uh, big difference in her baseline. She's under a lot of pressure right now. And then, and then we get an eye roll from her and that's, that's contempt. She's contemptuous of the questioning and the line of questioning. Now, what interests me is she's contemptuous around it. She's not angry about it. Now we'll see, we've seen anger or some elements of it in the past. And in a couple of videos time, I think we'll see some really clear anger from her. But look, if, if she really felt there was some innocence around any of that, I would expect more 
anger around the line of questioning, not contempt for the line of questioning. So the very, that eye roll for me just says contempt of the line of questioning. Um, and so that doesn't look good in terms of innocence, just that in of itself. Yeah, that's all I got on that one. I'm going to give it to Mark. Yeah, that, was, that was pro, Mark. Of course, you got to give it to me. Of course. I've been holding off on that. That was nuts. I mean, I just can't win every time. That's, you no, know, that, that was would, pro. That would look His unfair. dismount was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Your shopping dismount. I love a, I love it. You were worried. You, I, your counsel said this. I don't know if you believe it or, or agree with it, but I'm going to ask you. You needed to buy that slide and barrel because you were worried about taking this gun apart? Yes. Okay. But you just testified that you took the slide and barrel off of it. That's not taking the gun apart. We're talking about if we took the slide and barrel, the slide and barrel itself completely apart, could I put it back together and have a gun that wouldn't backfire on me and kill me? You know, and so the fact that when I said to Dan, I can take this gun, the real gun, not the kit played the gun apart, and it'll help me do this. Dan said, no, no. No, no, I've seen you in action. That's a mistake. Let's keep it together. We may get to sell it. I'm not talking about taking the entire gun apart. Okay. I'm talking about the slide and barrel. Yes. The critical piece of information, as you know now, if you didn't know before this trial, you know now the slide and barrel is what, is what it is at issue, right? Yes. You keep talking about the gun and taking it apart and all that. I'm talking about the slide and barrel. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You have a gun complete, uh -huh. slide and barrel intact. You know how to remove it, in fact, you did. Uh -huh. You can manipulate the slide and barrel separate and apart from the rest of the gun, uh -huh. but you chose to buy the exact same piece. Is that right? Yes, but I have a caveat on that too. Of course, go ahead. The caveat I have on that was I wasn't thinking, hey, uh, this would work that way. I was thinking because for me, the gun was the gun, the toy was the toy, the pieces were the toy. Your uh, attorney seemed to indicate that you happened upon the eBay slide and barrel. Yes. It was just a pop-up ad. No, it wasn't a pop-up ad. That's what she said. Well, if that's what she said, then I probably said that to her at one point or another, but it wasn't something that, uh, the slide and barrel was a, is that that? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't happen upon it. At the point that I decided I wanted to do this, I tend to be impulsive and I bought it because I wanted it. Where is it? I have no idea. If you'd asked me on the day of my arrest, I would have told you that it was either in the house or it was either in storage. I haven't seen it for months and months and months and months. So. And you just bought it in February and got it at the very last day of February, right? February 28th? Could be. I don't know. I mean, I'm not looking at my numbers, notes. You didn't lose this gun. No. You didn't lose the gun kit. The gun kit went to the police. The, the gun went to the police. I didn't have to worry about packing that. Miss Brophy, I'm talking about the time leading up to the murder. Oh, all right. No, I knew where it was. You knew where the ghost gun was? It was on the floor of my closet. You knew where that gun was? Yes. And I would tell you that the slide was on the floor of my closet next to the ghost gun. Just sitting on the floor? Mm-hmm. Just like literally sitting on the floor? Well, it wasn't in the middle. It was, tech, talk, it was tucked behind, next to, rather than behind, next to an armoire I had in the closet. Okay. When's the last time you saw it? That's what I was saying. I can't remember. I have no idea when the last time I saw it was. I know that I messed with it in February. I know I messed with it in March. But I can't remember seeing it after that. All right, Chase, what do you got? Oh, 
Or you're on your way to, to a classic. I can feel it. I can just, playing that like, so subtly as well. I really I was gonna go. got you on the hook there. <laughs> yeah. I thought this one's going to go. Yeah, I did too, man. I can you know, feel you know, it. You know the mistake you guys started making too early? Oh, yeah. You nodded too quick. Oh, uh, you're probably right. Subtle, you say. Uh, Amateurs. Amateurs. Yeah. Amateurs. Well, what I did... When I did my world record uh, last year, uh, the thing kept, when I look at it now, I can see Greg laughing and him doing this every couple. Of, when does he go? Yes, I agree with you. He never does that. You know, he was going. I, mm, yes. I was trying to give you a warning. Hey, uh, you're burning time. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Okay, go ahead. All right. Let's do it again. Let's pretend I'm coming back here. We're coming back. You ready? Yeah. Chase, what do you got? Uh, right here. She is shaking her head and moving her head to communicate with the, you know, where is it question. And this that's what I want to focus on here. We see the exhale followed by a memorized response. So it's a big question followed by an exhale. When we're not sure what all we're going to say about something, and she's already told us she goes on and on. She's already told us that she goes on and on. We will inhale before answering so we don't run out of air. But here we see an exhale. And when we see an exhale to an unknown question, we know this person's got something small and ready to go. Then we see repetition of words either two times. There's repetition of words months, three times. Then there's a micro expression of a smile after the months. I see a tiny little smile there on the face. And notice how when she describes where the slide was in the closet, her baseline comes back and where all this stuff was situated in her closet. She was almost frozen, frozen in place until this point. And also notice this precise, exacting detail. She remembers the location of every item except for maybe the last time she saw this slide. I think this is a perfect training worthy demonstration of behavioral change indicating these red flags instead of a predetermined list of body language cues. So here's a lesson for this clip, I think, and I'm just speaking for me, not these other three gentlemen here. I think change, being able to detect change is more important than being able to detect a checklist. Change over checklist. If we can make a bumper sticker out of that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more because, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's difficult to memorize the whole checklist. And so, you know, you're going to end up fairly amateur be just because of, you know, how much information you can't cram into your head. But if you just go via change, you got more a chance of, of, of accuracy and asking questions at good points. So I couldn't agree more. Um, look, uh, talking of amateurs, uh, she's getting starting to get angry now and then starting to get a little bit amateur in her uh, the way she's being in court because um, her 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 default now is being argumentative. So instantly she's into no around the pop up. Well, as a little bit of advice on how to argue really well and uh you know i i started arguing being trained to argue uh at the dinner table from a very being a very young uh, english child um never start to argue back until you have finished hearing the proposition <laughs> until you've you've really worked out what could i possibly be arguing here she doesn't wait to find out what the end of the proposition is, she's straight in with a with a no. Uh, he, ex of course, accepts that no because she's now arguing her own defense. Uh, it literally, uh, not literally, uh, figuratively, uh, shooting herself in the foot on this one. It's 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 unbelievable. Uh, lovely to see. Uh, complete amateur. Uh, please, whenever you're arguing, wait to hear what the argument could actually be. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, you just addressed Greg Hartley rule number three I learned from the Army. I learned three things from the Army that are powerful. Rule number three is you can't argue back when you're in a lower enlisted guy, so take your ass chewing and give feedback when asked. That works wonderfully because then you get time to build your whole story. She doesn't do that. There are a couple of other things she doesn't do well. I think, and, and Chase, you... 
you're singing my song. I love it. Baseline, baseline, baseline. Whatever the baseline is, when I see a deviation, I don't need to know everything about your baseline. If you always have your finger up your nose and you take it out, it means something. If you never have your finger up your nose and you put it in, it means something. Those changes are everything. This is a major, major baseline deviation. Everything here, I'll run through it. The yes, the thing she's used to lock down conversation, lilts up yes, didn't do that before. Why, why, why? I think there's something up here. Is that a fish for where this thing's going? She puts her finger to her head. First time we've seen that. What's going on? Well, we know that people put their finger to their head to think, but they also do it to release nervous energy in those muscles that are tensed up on the sides of your head. I think as you age, you get much better and much more contained. Doesn't mean you're more polished. Just means you can sit stoically more easily because it takes more energy to move. When she puts her head there, her finger to the side of her head, I think it's because she's trying to figure out where she's at. She's talked herself into a corner. And I think she is a squirrel in the road or a worm on a griddle right now. Her brain is going all over the place. She's trying to figure out as she tries to release that stress. And then she tightly embraces. And now she's doing what I call the egg protector. When you cross your uterus and tightly grip in women, it's the equivalent of men and chase. We agree on this. You call it genital protection. Men do it in front of your groin because you're protecting testicles, which are primary sex organs. Her arm does that. She eye blocks, and that's uncharacteristic of her. We haven't seen her eye block when she's trying to get away from the conversation. She does one shoulder up when she says, I bought it because I wanted it. Ding, ding, ding. We saw that way back. He does a great job with silence. He gets to the point he just lets her sit there and squirm for a minute. She's uncertain, and she eye locks and looks over to try to make contact with her counsel. And then she starts to become not articulate. If you pay attention to her words or her tools, at one point, a guy says, you researched. And she says, no, I didn't, because she's using past tense versus I was researching. And so English is a tool for her. It isn't here. You see her start to misplace words, use them incorrectly. And Chase, I agree with you. While she was very prepared for where things were in the closet, she even chooses the wrong words and uses them incorrectly there. And you see her arch her head in frustration with self when she does all those words. She's on the ropes right here, and it's a matter of how do you close from here. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. Uh, Chase and Mark, the dang baseline Yoda over there, one of the first things he says in body language tactics is almost that verbatim. Goes through and, and, and make sure that you understand the differences in what a baseline is from just what you've heard and the, and the, the list of things you get to watch out for that suggest or indicate deception. I think that's that's great. I don't can't believe we've never brought that up before. I think that's awesome. Here, this has her flustered because once again, <clears throat> she's busted really bad. And this is because of her, uh, in my opinion, because of her horrible communication with her attorney, because she's saying things that he's telling her things she said. She said, I didn't see. They said, yeah, you did. You said this and that. So there's that, there's that going on. That's what's got her flustered, got her sort of knocked out of the road a little bit there. And she's good, uh, one more time, she's good at lying because she creates those big, long stories and books, and she's a creative, and she can just, boom, create those little things and throw them out there. That's why she's, she she can hardly keep track of everything. And her memory, I'm going to go with her. I don't think her memory is that good because with all these things she's thrown out, she can't remember what she said because she's thrown out so many of them. And if you're going to be a liar, you better be able to 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 remember everything you said, every little detail, especially in a situation like this. But she's just got so much going on out there. She's chaffed and redirected so much, but done it wrong because she's used, she's saying facts and here's what really happened in this stuff. She can't keep up with it. So she can't keep it straight. She doesn't even know what she said. And I blame the attorney for that because he didn't get that straight with her as, as they went through. So I don't, I don't think they, they got solid on what her story was going to be or they were but I don't think they they ran like we would do run through this scenario with her or different scenarios and setups of questions and how it might come from a different angle. And they might add this to it or might add that to it. What happens if you don't know what to say? All those things. He might have had some. I think he probably did have some a little bit of training with her, but not enough. Not enough. All right. That's all I got. Your uh, attorney seemed to indicate that you happened upon the eBay sliding barrel. Yes. It was just a pop-up ad. No, it wasn't a pop-up ad. That's what she said. Well, if that's what she said, then I probably said that to her at one point or another, but it wasn't something that uh, 
the slide and barrel was a. Is that that? Uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't happen upon it. At the point that I decided I wanted to do this, I tend to be impulsive and I bought it because I wanted it. Where is it? I have no idea. If you'd asked me on the day of my rest, I would have told you that it was either in the house or it was either in storage. I haven't seen it for months and months and months and months. So. And you just bought it in February and got it at the very last day of February, right? February 28th? Could be. I don't know. I mean, I'm not looking at my numbers, notes. You didn't lose this gun. No. You didn't lose the gun kit. The gun kit went to the police. The, the gun went to the police. I didn't have to worry about packing that. Miss Brophy, I'm talking about the time leading up to the murder. Oh, all right. No, I knew where it was. You knew where the ghost gun was? It was on the floor of my closet. You knew where that gun was? Yes. And I would tell you that the slide was on the floor of my closet next to the ghost gun. Sitting on the floor? Mm-hmm. Just like literally... Sitting on the floor? Well, it wasn't in the middle. It was, tech, talk, it was tucked behind, next to, rather than behind, next to an armoire I had in the closet. Okay. When's the last time you saw it? That's what I was saying. I can't remember. I have no idea when the last time I saw it was. I know that I messed with it in February. I know I messed with it in March. But I can't remember seeing it after that. What? <laughs> Nothing. It's okay. Uh, Ms. Brophy, I'm going to come back uh, to that in a minute. Um, but I believe your answer was that you did have the discovery, you reviewed it. Yes. Okay. And you, you do realize or did realize that this slide and barrel that was outstanding was a, a central issue in this case? Yes, probably uh, eight months after my arrest, I realized that. Okay. And you understand that today? Yes. Now, you've testified, um, well, we've heard different things uh, from, your, from your interview with the police and what you've said on the stand that... You, you sort of hated guns, you didn't like them, but then you became interested in them for writing, then for safety, um, and then you seemed to take quite an interest after that in, in guns. Is, is that safe to say? I would say the irony is that we bought a gun to protect us, and it didn't protect us. I'm just asking about your interest in guns. My interest in guns were twofold. One is the protection, which it didn't work, and second is the writing, which has nothing to do with guns, but has to do with gun pieces. Right. But you said you became obsessed with firearms. I was, I was obsessed with the writing and the gun pieces, not with firearms. Okay. You know, I wasn't investigating AR-15s or shotguns or anything like that. Just Glocks? Just a handgun that would protect my character. And you did a lot of research online? Not yet. I've started it. So you didn't you just testify like that? I started researching that I research online all the time, but I, w I wasn't finished researching by any stretch of the imagination. You had been to a gun show. <clears throat> yes. Bought a gun. Yes. Bought a ghost gun. Went through that whole process. Right. Uh, when did you go to the gun range? I never have been to a gun range. Never been to a gun range. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, when she's saying, like, I'm doing research online, I haven't started it yet, this is in more injection of ambiguity in absolute perfect form here. She's letting you know that if you found something on my computer, that was just the beginning of research, so it's ambiguous. You can't draw conclusions based on that until I finish my research and if you let me finish, I'll go Google a bunch of other stuff to make it look way better. Now, I think there's something hiding in plain sight here. If you'll bear with me on this, 
uh, every couple of videos I go deep. I'm going deep. I think there's something hiding in plain sight. She says, my interest in guns was twofold. One is protection, which it didn't work. Right here is where I think she's letting out the secret, which it didn't work. I don't think she believes the gun is going to stand up and wake up and become conscious, jump out of the closet and stop a bad guy. That's not how guns work. I also don't think she meant protection for their home. I think when she's saying it didn't work, there's a chance here. She's alluding to the entire plan, not the gun not working. If you listen to it again, you're going to hear a very strange shift in vocal tone, pitch, cadence, all of that at one time. Second one is uh, writing about gun pieces. But she tells us the character uses the gun to protect himself. There's no gun that she says her character is using for protection, but he might be some kind of different guy who uses gun pieces to protect himself because that's what she's insinuating here. I'll leave it alone. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I'm not going to give her that much depth. I think she's half full of shit, and I think she's trying to cover herself. And I think the reason I say that is because her blink rate goes up, really up for her here. And now suddenly we do have irony. No, some irony in the story. Remember, way, way back in the beginning, she said there's no irony in this story. There's nothing funny in it. Well, it's starting to sound funny. And then she goes to her telling voice. They let her back off the hook. He just had her against the ropes really, really hard. But he lets her off the ropes. And she goes to that telling voice when she says, writing. I was writing. And here's where he... I think she's playing word games with him, which is when I think her brain is now back online because she starts to parse facts with him when he says, you researched, and she said, no, I was researching. I think she's using past tense as if she had completed it, and that's subtle. That's damn subtle, which means one of the things we know happens when you're under stress and you're feeling like you're on the ropes is you lose the ability to subtly use language. You call it loss of fluency, but we get to a point where we can barely even eke out facts so I think there, her brain is back and active. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of different nonverbal signals throughout all of these videos. Let's look for changes because we see a nonverbal indicator here that we've not seen in my mind anywhere else. And that is that she shows her bottom teeth quite pronounced. It's pretty quick. You're going to have to uh, slow it down and look at each frame, but you get a few frames of that bottom teeth showing. That is a indicator of anger, I would say, and it's anger on, I've never have been to the gun range, or it might be that gun range. I, I can't even read my own writing. So with that clear change in that we've never seen that before, something is up with that statement. Here's my bet. My bet is, yeah, she went there for a certain reason and she was firing off we the, a weapon or weapons for a certain reason. And, uh, and there's a big bunch of lies around all of this. And she's angry that she's being caught out here, though there's just a glimpse of it. But that's a piece of body language that we haven't seen from her as of yet. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. When they discussed a statement or when the uh, irony statement comes up she shows disgust one of the first things we heard her say was there was no irony in this there's no nothing happy about this here she's saying the irony in this is she's saying there's irony in this she's she's changed again she's got so much out there she can't remember what she said or what she's doing she can't keep up with everything um excuse me any you i was going to cover a lot of those things more um at the end again she she contradicts herself when she's talking about uh being obsessed with guns before she said she she was and now she's not so I, i'm sort of losing interest in her or whatever she has to say I, I think probably a lot of people are there as well because it's just all kinds of different stuff it's hard to keep up with greg what do you got no no I, i've already gone i was just Oh. leaning in but but i oh. will say this i i feel her pain about browser history if i ever get in trouble <laughs> i look up all this true crime crap every oh, yeah. week and they're gonna ask us about it i'm just gonna say yeah man he was weird because if i go against that really thing, into I think that I'm murder stuff <laughs> <laughs> uh miss Brophy, i'm gonna come back uh to that in a minute um 
but I believe your answer was that you did have the discovery, you reviewed it. Yes. Okay. And you, you do realize or did realize that this slide and barrel that was outstanding was at a central issue in this case? Yes, probably uh, eight months after my arrest, I realized that. Okay. And you understand that today? Yes. Now, you've testified, um, well, we've heard different things uh, from, your, from your interview with the police and what you've said on the stand that you, you sort of hated guns, you didn't like them, but then you became interested in them for writing, then for safety, um, and then you seem to have taken quite an interest after that in, in guns. Is, is that safe to say? I would say the irony is that we bought a gun to protect us, and it didn't protect us. I'm just asking about your interest in guns. My interest in guns were twofold. One is the protection, which it didn't work, and second is the writing, which has nothing to do with guns, but has to do with gun pieces. Right. But you said you became obsessed with firearms. I was, I was obsessed with the writing and the gun pieces, not with firearms. Okay. You know, I wasn't investigating AR-15s or shotguns or anything like that. Just Glocks? Just a handgun that would protect my character. And you did a lot of research online? Not yet. <clears throat> I've started it. So you, didn't you just testify like? That I've started researching, that I research online all the time, but I, w I wasn't finished researching by any stretch of the imagination. You had been to a gun show? <clears throat> yes. Bought a gun? Yes. Bought a ghost gun? Went through that whole process? Right. Uh, when did you go to the gun range? I never have been to a gun range. Never been to a gun range. In fact, the, the company that you bought the gun through, J&B Firearms, uh -huh. that's actually a gun store that's very close to your house, right? It turned out to be, yeah. They had recommended that you go to uh, Threat Dynamics or that gun range that we've uh -huh. seen a couple of times. Uh, you never went to the Threat Dynamics? Never. You've never gone to the Tri-County Gun Club? Is that the one that we keep talking about out on 26? No. Oh, well, no, I've never been there. Where were you going on the 26th when you were out near that gun range? Oh, on the two random days in March that we've been talking about off and on? Is that what you're asking me about now? Yes. Okay. Uh... Dan and I had decided that that was an area we wanted to look at. I'm driving around frequently out there trying to look to see if there's any property, anything that leaps out at us, anything that is all the requirements Dan has. The land has to be flat for gardening. The land has to be fairly treeless so that we don't have the shadow hanging over it. I know what he requires, and I know what I need in the house. Isn't you that know? state land out there? It is after fashion, and that's why I didn't go all the way out to where you're saying it was. I went out after fashion, came back. You just drove out there randomly, were there less than a couple of minutes, and then headed back to Portland on no, the 26th? I didn't, I didn't do any of the... Wait, let's stop. Let, ask your question to me again, and let me see if on I... On the 26th, the first day, I believe okay. it was Monday. Right. Uh, while Dan was at work. Right. Uh, you drove out to that area. Right. And according to cell site location information, it appears that you drove out there, turned around, and drove back. I don't think I drove that far out there. I mean, you know, I don't, I, if, I know that it's out there. I know because we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, but I have never, ever, ever been there. And if I had been going there, I would have gone there with Dan, and I would have gone there with... We ended up at the closest I got to it. We had, what, two minutes, 10 minutes that I could have spent there? I can think if I was just going out to fire a gun at dirt, that I could have found someplace a whole lot closer to my house than driving an hour and a half to make that happen. So you knew about that gun range? I had heard about the gun range from the J&B people. In fact, that's your handwriting, right? On I don't the know. I haven't seen that note in ages. Receipt. So you knew it was there, though? 
And I'm not sure that is my handwriting as I'm thinking about it. I think they wrote it down. Okay. But, but I can look at the note again and tell you. Let's not get lost in the weeds here. Okay. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is her uh, gun range alibi. Again, we're back to big gestures that are out of her usual baseline of gestures. So we know she's under heat here. She's most likely uh, lying. In fact, let's just say she's going to be lying at this point because the gestures are now too big. Uh, they're out there. They're leaving the frame. So that's definite deception from my point of view. And, and just one little one. She goes and covers her her throat again that alone super sternal, doesn't, notch. Doesn't, super sternal notch yeah uh there she goes for that that's just a little additive for fun but the the big gestures are enough for me to go you're making this stuff up greg what do you got on this one yeah she right out of the gate conditions a question you know when he starts asking her about going to this place and she says is that the one that well come on who cares which one it is you either been there or you haven't uh, and a better question so here's where we get to questioning and why questioning matters if you say have you ever been to this gun range they get a chance to say yes or no and that conversation is over but if i ask you have you ever fired the gun well if you say yes in my backyard you have violated a city statute i got you there and if you say no, then I'll say, well, why was there residue? So look, there's a lot of things that allow you to be able to take it in another direction. The best way you would go is say, hey, when did you fire that gun? Where did you fire that gun? How did you fire that gun? How many times? And then you get lots of other opportunities to find information. Plus, they know it's been fired. They've got residue. Look, they've got the gun. They can do all kinds of tests, know all kinds of things that she doesn't know. Again, she starts to condition the question. And then she gets to this point where she's talking about, I don't think I went there. And if I did, and Mark, I think she's got this all scripted in her head, but she's in trouble. You're dead on. I mean, suddenly her arms come up. They start doing things she's not done yet. And she's when she starts to get the things that she wants to say, her hands come up. A lot of politicians, Joe Biden's one, but there are many others, career politicians, that when they hit prepared information, their hands start doing this. She actually starts to do it like a politician on the stump. And then she starts down the rabbit hole and she starts talking about, here we're getting a non-pertinent. I went way out there. Well, isn't that state land? Well, yeah, and that's why I stopped short. Well, come on. She almost got misaligned from what she wanted to say because the questions are good. And that's why she keeps trying to do a reset. Then she says my favorite line of the entire thing. I never have, but if I did, he would have gone with me. I never have. I never have. She throat protects. You should lean into her really hard right then. But, but he misses that chance. And she starts to redirect again. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, right when you hear her say, oh, on those two random days in March, listen carefully. She's introducing the concept of these days being random. Uh, this is an unconscious desire for us to also see the behavior on those days as completely random. Watch when these words are unusually injected into speech. I usually default to thinking something happened that's the opposite of that word. Whatever that word is, whatever it is, that's something concealing. So whatever it is there is random. So something very not random happened on those days because that word's being deliberately injected in there where it doesn't really belong. Her hands come up to start this story in a way that is both, I think, unnatural and is hesitancy. There's hesitancy there when her hands go back down. When her right hand falls onto her wrist, then begins this serious like massage session and by this, I mean she's self-soothing and trying to just burn off excess energy here. Then there's ever, ever, ever been there. That's three repetitions there. This is another one of her classic repetitions. We've seen her do this a lot. And she's saying uh, firing a gun at dirt. Very, very specific. Is this a detail spike? I think so. This is where I think she went out there to do something very specific, which was not random. And I'm willing to bet something more happened here. And it could potentially be meeting up with someone to maybe drop off, pick up something. You're not going to go into a range and shoot in 10 minutes. In most ranges, some ranges you could just walk in and start shooting and they don't charge you. It's pretty rare. Maybe there was a few bullets fired. You could definitely accomplish that in a couple of minutes. That's all I got, Scott. 
All right. You, you guys covered everything. And, and I'm not going to say anything that, that I haven't said up to this point. I'm still seeing all the same stuff, except for that mouth grooming she was doing. I think that's an adapter. She's using that to adapt because it is repetitive. And that's those repetitive pacifying behaviors that we consider to be um, adapters to get rid of that built up stress or tension. All right. Oh, man, that's good, Mark. But I think Greg meant it. <laughs> In fact, the, the company that you bought the gun through J&B Firearms, mm -hmm. that's actually a gun store that's very close to your house, right? It turned out to be, yeah. They had recommended that you go to uh, Threat Dynamics or that gun range that we've mm -hmm. seen a couple of times. Uh, you never went to Threat Dynamics? Never. You've never gone to the Tri-County Gun Club? Is that the one that we keep talking about out on 26? No. Oh, well, no, I've never been there. Where were you going on the 26th when you were out near that gun range? Oh, on the two random days in March that we've been talking about off and on? Is that what you're asking me about now? Yes. Okay. Uh... Dan and I had decided that that was an area we wanted to look at. I'm driving around frequently out there trying to look to see if there's any property, anything that leaps out at us, anything that is all the requirements Dan has. The land has to be flat for gardening. The land has to be fairly treeless so that we don't have the shadow hanging over it. I know what he requires, and I know what I need in the house. Isn't you that know? state land out there? It is after fashion, and that's why I didn't go all the way out to where you're saying it was. I went out after fashion, came back. You just drove out there randomly, were there less than a couple of minutes, and then headed back to Portland on no, the 26th? No, I didn't, I didn't do any of the... Wait, let's stop. Let, ask your question to me again, and let me see if I... On the I 26th, need. the first day, I believe okay. it was a Monday. Right. Uh, while Dan was at work. Right. Uh, you drove out to that area. Right. And according to cell site location information, it appears that you drove out there, turned around, and drove back. I don't think I drove that far out there. I mean, you know, I don't, I, if, I know that it's out there. I know because we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, but I have never, ever, ever been there. And if I had been going there, I would have gone there with Dan, and I would have gone there with... We ended up at the closest I got to it. We had, what, two minutes, ten minutes that I could have spent there? I can think if I was just going out to fire a gun at dirt that I could have found someplace a whole lot closer to my house than driving an hour and a half to make that happen. So you knew about that gun range? I had heard about the gun range from the J&B people. In fact, that's your handwriting, right? On I don't know. I haven't seen that note in ages. Receipt. So you knew it was there, though? And I'm not sure that is my handwriting, so I'm thinking about it. I think they wrote it down. Okay. But, but I can look at the note again and tell you. Let's not get lost in the weeds here. Okay. You uh -huh. get up. You Google how to load a Glock 9 millimeter. Uh-huh. You drive out to an area that Wait, wait. I don't know that I Googled that, but if you say I did, I'd, I'd like to see that. But I could have. I mean, once again, I am, I am messing with gun pieces. You know, I am not messing with uh, research. I am not messing with, uh, so I could have put that in that morning if I had some spare time, because I don't think I gave up the gun research until the beginning of April when I knew I had to get back and finish my other story. Part of the problem is, is if you don't finish the story you're on, then you have story pieces everywhere. and. You know, people say, what's the most difficult thing about writing a book? It's finishing the book. You have to force yourself to finish it. When you've written yourself into a hole, it's real easy to see a new idea out there that would be more interesting. You have to go back and force yourself. So, yeah, I had a few months where I flirted with guns. But real frankly, my goal was to finish the book I was on. Okay, so in March, you are doing research at that point. I could be, Yes. And uh, can we go ahead and put up States Exhibit 82? Sure. Go there to March 26th, 10.13 a.m. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. 
searching, loading a nine millimeter Glock. Okay. Uh, immediately after that, searching, cleaning a Glock. Okay. And then you get in your car. Okay. Drive out to an area that has now been established as where that Wolf Creek gun range is. I don't know why I put this back on. Uh, okay, but it, I was I can guarantee you that I wouldn't have gone that far. And the reason why is because that's all forested land and it's higher elevation than what Dan wanted. But I'm not going to tell you I wasn't out there because I probably was. You know, you've got video that shows my phone visited it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, she's waiting at every turn to grab the story. And when she gets a natural break point where she he's asking her about looking something up and she gets a chance to chaff and redirect, she runs with it. She grabs and starts running with a line. He lets her run out of line and then locks her back down. Love that. But she adapts by self-grooming. She actually is playing with her hair at one point for the first time. She's in her element, though, when she's talking because she's milling her hands and running with that line. Then he shuts it down and locks her down. And she is, she then adapts by rubbing at these muscles that are stressed these muscles in here that show stress and concern and we often will touch them when we're feeling something um then my favorite part of the whole thing they tell her to look at something and she picks up her seeing eye mask and puts it on she picks up her reading mask and puts it on and she even says out loud why did i put this thing on her brain is a, a worm on the griddle right now she's spinning in circles she's fried Look, guys, this is one hour of a much longer thing. If you really want some entertainment, watch the rest of it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just cover a couple of things here I think are interesting. When she says, I gave up on the gun thing, what happened to being not finished shopping and not finished doing the research? She gave up on it, she said, and gave up on it. And... I think the, the most classic line ever is in this video. And like, I didn't want to give up on it because you would have story pieces everywhere. This entire testimony is story pieces everywhere. So I think she needed a chance to complete the research on this, on what she was doing. She wanted a chance to complete the research on her alibi, on her story. And now she's, I think, unconsciously referring to exactly what's going on in her own testimony. There are story pieces everywhere. Mark? Yeah, couldn't agree more. She, Her brain is absolutely fried at this point. She's only an hour into it, which just suggests that you can't go into lying in, in under these conditions at an amateur level. You're going to have to be much, much better to withstand what's, what's happening. She feels that she's prepared, and really she is not because she's already... Well, her, her, her just her cognitive skills are, are, are right down. She's putting on a mask when she should be putting on glasses, and then she's realizing that uh, uh, later on. But so by the end of it, we see that her hand, one hand, is right inside the elbow there, protecting the joints there. She has uh, cocooned at, at this point. Uh, it's it's pretty much all over for her, I would think. I haven't seen the rest of it. But I, but I would think it's going to be difficult for her to recover from this point on. Maybe she does. might be interesting to look. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I agree. And here's what she's done. You're right, Chase. She, what she's describing is what has been happening to her. That's what she's talking about here is what's happened to her testimony. It's in pieces, like I've been saying the whole time. It's in all kinds of different pieces, and she can't keep track of everything. Now, she's uh, with all these pieces everywhere, so she can't gather them all up. What her brain goes to is what she talked about in there as well. She gets tired of it. You have to finish it, and you have to because you see something else that you want to create something else, or you see something else you can work on, something else to be created with. That's what's happening. That's why her story, as it goes along, it starts it starts busting up more and more because she's trying to fix these things, these little uh, crappy answers she gave. She's making them bigger and better. She's qualifying using qualifiers to make her story bigger and better, and it's getting out of hand with her. She can't she can't keep it because, like you guys all said, her brain is just as she's fried at this point. She's her brain is tired. She's reached the maximum capacity of. <laughs> she can't do anymore. You know, that's it. She can't keep track of it. So it's getting out of hand. Um, 
And, and I think a lot of this, again, I blame on her attorney for not staying with her and not connecting with her and saying, look, you got to do this. Here's how we do this. I think this, a lot of that could have been avoided. But at, having said that, I think that attorney is, is uh, smart enough to have worked in and set those same traps. I think she would have fallen into those uh, traps as well. You uh -huh. get up, you Google how to load a Glock nine millimeter. Uh huh. You drive out to an area that wait, wait. I don't know that I googled that, but if you say I did, I'd, I'd like to see that. But I could have. I mean, once again, I am, I am messing with gun pieces. You know, I am not messing with uh, research. I am not messing with. Uh, so I could have put that in that morning if I had some spare time, because I don't think I gave up the gun research until the beginning of April when I knew I had to get back and finish my other story. Part of the problem is, is if you don't finish the story you're on, then you have story pieces everywhere. And, you know, people say, what's the most difficult thing about writing a book? It's finishing the book. You have to force yourself to finish it. When you've written yourself into a hole, it's real easy to see a new idea out there that would be more interesting. You have to go back and force yourself. So yeah, I had a few months where I flirted with guns, but real frankly, my goal was to finish the book I was on. Okay, so in March, you are doing research at that point. I could be, yes. And uh, can we go ahead and put up State's Exhibit 82? Sure. Go there to March 26th, 10.13 a.m. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. Searching, loading a 9-millimeter Glock. Okay. Uh, immediately after that, searching, cleaning a Glock. Okay. And then you get in your car. Okay. Drive out to an area that has now been established as where that Wolf Creek gun range is. I don't know why I put this back on. Uh, okay, but it, I was I can guarantee you that I wouldn't have gone that far, and the reason why is because that's all forested land, and it's higher elevation than what Dan wanted. But I'm not going to tell you I wasn't out there, because I probably was. You know, you've got video that shows my phone visited it. Mark, what do you think we're seeing so far in this? Yeah, I, I think what we're really seeing here is how much you'd really have to prepare, how good you'd have to be, and also the amount of stress you'd have to be prepared for in order to be a good liar in this situation. I was just thinking, just then before you asked me, Scott, uh, about the World Cup and England playing, and we, England, uh, you know, we, we had a terrible uh, penalty uh, shootout, uh, and, and there was a guy there who he must practice all day, every day, shooting uh, a a ball into a goal and he shot it right over the top something he does every day why did he do that the stress of the situation so you can practice and practice and practice your lies but you have to practice them under stress because under stress you're gonna fall to bits uh, chase what are you seeing i see the opposite of oj simpson oj simpson wrote a book called if i did it and before this happened, she wrote a book that essentially was titled Somebody Did It. And we're kind of seeing the exact same thing in reverse. This entire case, I think, was a person thinking that she was maybe too brilliant to face up the law because she's written so many mysteries and she's such a good writer. She even claimed to have amnesia as an excuse during her trial, which we didn't cover here today. And I think we'll see more books. I do think we'll see more books. I understand they aren't the best, but whenever she's able to release one from prison, I will personally read it because I can't wait. I think there's going to be some parallel metaphors up in there. Greg? Yeah. So they say if you took enough chimpanzees, gave them typewriters and enough time, they could randomly write war and peace. There's a corollary to that. If you are being interrogated or you're on the stand and you keep talking, there are only so many words in the English language and in each of our lexicons, even fewer you will eventually, by negative and by 360, paint the picture of what has happened. So one piece of advice, shut up. That's the best thing you can possibly do when you're being interrogated. And if you don't know if your client is good on the stand, but she talks this much, this is real easy. This person stood up there and gave you so much information that, and this is in one hour, imagine what average people are thinking sitting there. Scott, what do you got? 
Yeah, I, I really like this one because we, we see her just slowly fall apart. It's like when those spaceships come in or, or the satellites come in from space and they start breaking up in the atmosphere and things just start falling off of them. It starts getting bigger and bigger. That's exactly what happened. And and that other attorney was able to get in there and grab it. Oh, there's that. There's that. Let me see that. And puts them all together and saves them up. He goes, well, you said this. Oh, yeah. Well, you said this, too. What about that? And she she can't defend it. She's just flopping around in there. Her brain is is spent, so she's got nothing left to fight with. So, I th- and I think that's a great example of that. It's a wonderful example of it. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. So, what do you got?